Fearing that Zip Merlot might be dying, Kevin decides to board the rocket with Zara and head to the moon immediately. Zip's knowledge of the terrain will be necessary for Kevin to track down Quentin Covington and figure out his evil plot. Kevin also has mated his grail to bring Zip back to Earth alive. Meanwhile, the stress of the mayoral campaign and opponent Hayden Smart's accusations have Lily collapsing at a press conference. The outdated Apollo rocket, now retrofitted for its modern mission, surged clear of the Earth's atmosphere. Kevin and Zara buckled securely into their seats and felt the exhilarating force of the main engines propelling them into the vast darkness beyond. As the rocket soared into the inky, endless galaxy, the roar of the engines gradually subsided, giving way to an eerie silence. Kevin and Zara shared a curious look. Main takeoff engines fading, Kevin noted. That means we're clear of the Earth's atmosphere. Space, Zara whispered with a sense of awe. We're in space. The vibrations that once coursed through the cabin ceased, leaving Kevin and Zara suspended in a quiet vacuum. The zero gravity indicator blinked, signaling the onset of a weightless realm. Kevin's eyes sparkled with excitement, reflecting the childlike wonder of a man who had never experienced the weightlessness of space before. Zara, too, shared in the exhilaration. Long-range engines need about five minutes to warm up, Kevin noted. Should we stretch our legs? Zara smiled as she unbuckled from her seat, floating effortlessly through the cabin. Kevin did the same. How amazing is this? Zara exclaimed with delight. I never thought I'd get to experience zero gravity. Zara, her long hair floating around her like a celestial halo, grinned. It's like flying without wings. I could get used to this. Don't get too comfortable, Kevin noted. Three minutes till long-range engines ignite. Zara nodded in understanding. They only had a few moments to enjoy before more important matters took hold of their attention. The sense of playfulness enveloped them as they spun and twirled, reveling in the microgravity environment. The journey to the moon momentarily transformed into a celestial playground. The whimsical dance in zero gravity came to an abrupt halt. A sudden impact jolted the rocket, sending alarms blaring and sirens wailing through the cabin. Kevin and Zara, now tethered by the gravity of an impending crisis, exchanged worried glances. What was that? Zara wondered. Check the navigational computer, Kevin added. Zara swiftly checked the computer readouts. We've been hit. We're losing air and fuel. Fast. Kill the long-range engines, Kevin ordered. But Kevin, what about the moon? Zara countered. We won't make it to the moon in a leaking ship. Kevin's expression tightened the weight of the situation pressed upon him. He looked out the tiny rocket windows trying to see what he could outside. Debris! It's more debris! Zara exclaimed. The hull of the ship was hit by a dozen tiny pieces of metal, moving at a high rate of speed. It's like being shot at. How do we fix it? Kevin probed. Zara hesitated for a moment before delivering the stark reality. There's only one way. One of us has to go out there, spacewalk, and make manual repairs. The gravity of Zara's words hung in the air in unspoken acknowledgement of the perilous task that awaited them. The silent void outside the cabin contrasted with the urgency pulsating within. Kevin, drawing on a reservoir of determination, met Zara's gaze with a resolute nod. I'll suit up, Kevin declared, the weight of responsibility settling upon his shoulders. As the cabin echoed with the urgency of their actions, the Apollo rocket, wounded but holding together for now, floated lifeless through space. The dance of weightlessness had given way to a desperate struggle for survival, where the endless darkness became both friend and enemy in the quest to reach the lunar surface. The silence within the Apollo rocket was shattered as the radio crackled to life transmitting the stern voice of NASA Chief Worm Greenleaf. Kevin, we're detecting anomalies in your flight plan. You haven't fired your long-range rockets yet. What's happening up there? Chief, we have a problem, Kevin responded, his voice steady despite the urgency that reverberated through the cabin. 
As Kevin explained the situation, Greenleaf's measured voice relayed the gravity of their predicament. I think we have to cancel, make nominal repairs, then turn back towards Earth. We can't risk your lives with the already outdated rocket not in perfect shape. A palpable tension hung in the air as Kevin hesitated. He glanced at Zara, her eyes full of determination. What do you think? Kevin asked the young tech whiz. You lead and I'll follow, Zara replied. Kevin refocused on the radio. We can't stop now, Chief, Kevin asserted, a resolve tightening his jaw. I'm heading outside to begin repairs. A stunned silence followed Kevin's revelation. Outside in the cold and unforgiving void of space where the laws of gravity held no sway, Kevin intended to attempt a manual repair. It was a daring move, a cosmic gamble that defied the boundaries of conventional space travel. Kevin, are you out of your mind? Greenleaf's voice crackled over the radio. You've never been to space before, let alone spacewalked. This is a suicide mission. We can't turn back now, Kevin explained. The mission is too important. Greenleaf sighed audibly. Good luck. The gravity of Greenleaf's words hung in the air as Kevin prepared to undertake the death-defying journey into the cosmic unknown. Strapped into his spacesuit, Kevin braced himself for the imminent spacewalk. Kevin stepped into the airlock and sealed himself inside. He punched in the code and the main hatch creaked open. The abyss of space beckoned. The void of space stretched out before Kevin as he stepped onto the Apollo rocket's hull, the vastness of the cosmos unfurling around him. His suit-clad figure became a lone silhouette against the backdrop of distant stars, a solitary figure tasked with the impossible challenge of repairing the damaged rocket in the darkness of space. With each careful movement, Kevin surveyed the damage. The harsh reality of the compromised hull became apparent, and the weight of the mission bore down on him. He radioed to Zara. I see multiple holes in the hull, Kevin conveyed calmly. I'm going to try to patch them. There's another problem, Zara's voice crackled with fear. You only have ten minutes. Ten minutes, Kevin repeated. Why? The engines can't be shut down for longer or there's a chance they'll freeze up and never fire again. Zara warned with an urgency lacing her words. Kevin sighed. Copy. Ten minutes. The seconds ticked away as Kevin went to work. The extensive damage demanded his full focus and his hands moved with the precision of a cosmic surgeon. As the final adjustments fell into place, Zara's voice relayed the news. Readings inside the ship are back to normal. You've done it, Kevin. But just as a sigh of relief threatened to escape, Kevin's keen senses caught a glimpse of impending danger. Fragments of an unknown origin were hurtled toward him in a chaotic dance. Zara, new debris field incoming! Kevin exclaimed as he raced back towards the hatch. It was too late. The debris began to hit Kevin and the ship. The rocket took the hits, but the hull remained intact. Kevin was not as lucky. A sharp impact reverberated through Kevin's suit, and a momentary panic set in. His punctured suit began leaking precious air into the abyss of space. My suit's been hit, Kevin radioed to Zara. I'm losing air. Get back on the ship, Zara shouted. There's a bigger wave of debris on its way. We have to go. With the clock ticking down and a second larger wave of debris looming, Kevin propelled himself back towards the ship. The seconds felt like an eternity as he re-entered the cabin, his suit compromised but the mission intact. Zara, I'm inside the airlock. Punch it, Kevin shouted, his voice strained. Get us out of here. Zara, quick on the controls, powered up the long-range engines just as the debris field closed in. The rocket surged forward, narrowly escaping the cosmic storm. Clear! We're clear! Zara declared. They were safe for now, with the debris field retreating into the vastness of space. As the silence settled within the cabin, Kevin caught his breath. The weight of the near catastrophe lingered in the air. He decompressed, removing his spacesuit with a sense of relief and exhaustion. The extensive damage to the suit caught his attention, a testament to the perilous dance with debris in the unforgiving expanse of space. Surveying the holes that riddled the suit, Kevin felt a rush of gratitude for being alive. 
However, amid the post-crisis assessment, something caught Kevin's eye. A piece of debris stuck out from the chest area of the spacesuit. Curious, Kevin plucked it from the fabric and examined it closely. To his astonishment, Kevin held in his hand the driver's license of Mario Kessler, his old nemesis. What the? The realization hung in the air. When he last saw Mario, he had shot himself into space when Mario tried to kill Kevin during the last stages of the epic clash, but turned the space gun the wrong way and blasted himself. But how could his license be part of the debris field from Covington Space Station? Kevin's mind raced, trying to piece together the cosmic puzzle. The unexpected connection to Mario, a dark figure from his past, added a layer of intrigue to the already tumultuous mission. Questions swirled in Kevin's mind, each one leading to another, like a trail of stardust in the cosmic vastness. As the Apollo rocket hurtled further into the cosmic unknown, Kevin found himself grappling not only with the challenges of the mission, but also with the unexpected threads of his past that seemed to intertwine with the mysteries of the present. The journey of the moon, once a quest for answers, had now taken an unforeseen turn, one that, somehow, some way, involved Mario Kessler. Kevin and Zara's mission to the moon, where Kevin hopes to get answers about Quentin Covington's evil plots while he also hopes to rescue long-stranded astronaut Zip Murlot, goes wrong very quickly. Their rocket is battered by metallic space debris. Kevin embarks on a spacewalk to make the repairs, but his spacesuit is shredded by more strange items whipping through the empty skies, including, strangely and ominously, the driver's license of Kevin's longtime enemy, Mario Kessler. With the immediate threat of the debris field behind them, Kevin and Zara resumed their long journey toward the moon. The temporary repairs held, and the refit Apollo rockets, scarred but resilient, hurtled through the cosmic expanse. A two-day flight lay in front of them, a silent traverse through the vastness of space. Kevin and Zara, aware of the potential for further encounters with celestial debris, took turns staying vigilant, each keeping watch for any signs of impending danger while the other slept. As the hours unfolded, the cosmic ballet outside the ship continued, the stars and celestial bodies performing an intricate dance against the backdrop of infinity. Kevin and Zara, confined within the metal cocoon of the rocket, navigated the silence of space with a shared determination to reach their lunar destination. As they were about to switch shifts, Zara took note of something. Our oxygen levels are high. Oxygen? Kevin repeated. Do we know the cause? Computer says we're leaking air, Zara repeated, but not out into space, into the main cabin. Kevin, though obsessive in his efforts to salvage the damaged hull, unintentionally created a new challenge. Too much oxygen was slowly seeping into the ship, a consequence of his thorough repair work. The delicate balance within the confined space now demanded their attention. Zara, ever the tech whiz, accessed the ship's monitoring systems. We're okay for now, but we need to monitor it closely. Too much oxygen can be as problematic as too little. But for now, breathe it in, Kevin quipped. The two astronauts, bound by the shared goal of reaching the moon and uncovering the mysteries that awaited them, settled into a routine of celestial vigilance. They took turns monitoring for debris and monitoring the ship's systems, ensuring that the delicate equilibrium within the cabin remained intact and that they were not overcome by an overdose of oxygen. The silence of space enveloped them, broken only by the occasional hum of machinery and quiet sounds of eating. Space food is rad, Zara offered. Kevin nodded in agreement. More freeze-dried ice cream? Please, Zara responded with delight. As the rocket hurtled toward the lunar surface, the cosmic expanse unfolded before them, a canvas of wonder and uncertainty. The two astronauts intertwined in the dance of celestial navigation forged ahead, their eyes fixed on the lunar horizon. Late one night in the quiet solitude of the rocket's cabin, with Zara peacefully asleep, Kevin found himself drawn to the communication console. He checked in with mission control. NASA, 
This is Kevin Williams. It is 0800 hours. The ship's hull remains intact. Oxygen levels remain at a high but breathable level. The transmission cackled to life and Greenleaf's familiar voice filled the cabin. Copy that, Kevin. How are you feeling? Feeling? Kevin replied. That's right, Greenleaf repeated. You've been through a lot up there already. You're not a robot. How are you feeling? I miss my wife, Lily, Kevin offered with a certain romance in his voice. Understandable, Greenleaf noted. Are you married, Chief? Kevin asked, curious. Greenleaf hesitated. I was, almost 20 years. Best years of my life. That was a long time ago now. I'm sorry. Kevin wanted to say more, but knew that they were broadcasting across all of space. He held back. He changed the subject. I've been thinking, Chief. Kevin began, his voice a low murmur so as not to disturb Zara's slumber. Space is truly incredible. Every moment is like witnessing a miracle. Greenleaf chuckled warmly. Agreed. That's why I dedicated my life to it. It's all pretty awe-inspiring, isn't it? Absolutely, Kevin agreed. I never thought I'd get to experience it. I was in a simulation once before that made me believe that I was in space, but it was all virtual reality. It was part of a contest. Yes, the epic clash which you won, Kevin. Don't be so modest, Worm Greenleaf said. He had clearly been doing his research on Kevin. Kevin still didn't want to talk about his accomplishments. He wanted to talk about space. But this, this is something else. It's just different. Have you ever been to space yourself, Chief? Kevin asked. There was a pause on the other end of the line before Greenleaf responded, his voice carrying a wistful note. No, Kevin. I was never able to pass the physical test required for astronauts. I wish I had those pills you gave me back in the day when I could have qualified for missions. I would have made it to Pluto by now. The revelation lingered in the air, a shared acknowledgement of missed opportunities and untapped potential. Despite this somewhat sad admission by the chief, which almost embarrassed him, a camaraderie began to form between Kevin and Greenleaf, forged by their mutual appreciation for the cosmos. I can't promise you a direct line, Greenleaf continued, but I can get a message to your wife. What would you like me to say? Kevin thought for a beat. He hesitated, then refocused on the radio. Tell her, tell her I'm all right. I'm flying through space, but she's my North Star. Smooth, Greenleaf joked. Kevin smiled. Tell me, Kevin, between me and you, what are you seeing out there? Greenleaf inquired, a genuine interest in his voice. Kevin, leaning closer to the communication console, described the celestial wonders unfolding beyond the ship. He spoke of the vastness of space, the shimmering constellations, and the ethereal beauty of Earth from a cosmic perspective. Greenleaf listened, appreciating the vivid imagery did by Kevin's words. As Kevin shared his experiences, a connection deepened between the two men. The boundaries of their roles as astronauts and chiefs dissolved giving way to a shared appreciation for the majesty of the cosmos. Thanks for sharing that, Kevin, Greenleaf said. I may not have made it to space, but having you describe it is the next best thing. The bond between the two men solidified and it transcended the distance between Earth and the rocket hurtling through space. In the silent embrace of the cosmic expanse, Kevin and Greenleaf had become friends. The rocket continued to surge forward towards its ultimate destination. As Kevin and Zara finally approached the moon, the excitement of the impending lunar landing filled the cabin. Their destination was Zib Merlot's campsite, strategically located not too far from the edge of the dark side of the moon. The coordinates were set, and the anticipation of discovery hung in the air. We should be landing right by Zib's camp, Kevin offered. We still haven't had any communication with him, so let's hope he's all right. Landing on the moon was no easy feat, but Kevin's skills as a pilot reassured Zara. As they began their descent, the moon's desolate surface loomed closer, a stark contrast to the cosmic splendor they had left behind. Touchdown in T minus two minutes, Kevin called out. Strap in. Zara climbed back into her seat and buckled up. T minus one minute, Kevin continued. Landing looking good. Just then, the descent took an unforeseen turn. A random spark in the electrical system ignited a massive fire within the cabin. 
Zara spotted the flames first. Fire! Kevin, fire in the main cabin! The additional oxygen, a consequence of Kevin's thorough repairs, turned the flames to an almost instant inferno. Kevin processed. He had to act fast. Zara, take the controls. I'll try to cut off the fire. Kevin commanded, urgency lacing his words. Zara assumed control as Kevin turned his attention to the flames which were growing larger and hotter by the second. Kevin moved across the cabin, closing hatches wherever possible, in an attempt to suffocate the flames. But the fire resisted, growing with the veracity that threatened to consume the entire spacecraft. Kevin fought valiantly, using every resource available to kill the inferno. The flames retreated, but not completely. The situation teetered on the edge of disaster. Zara tried to land the ship, but the controls were erratic. The Apollo rocket was being thrown off course. Kevin, brace for landing, Zara shouted over the roar of the flames. Zara guided the quickly descending rocket toward the lunar surface, her hand steady on the controls. The landing was awkward, but Zara managed to bring the rocket down. As the dust settled on the moon's surface, Kevin's voice cut through the post-landing tension. We need to get out of the ship before the flames consume us. Put on your helmet. The urgency of the situation hung in the air as they secured their helmets, preparing to exit the rocket. However, a new obstacle emerged. The hatch refused to open. Frustration mounted as Kevin and Zara struggled with the unyielding door. Why won't it open? Zara exclaimed. The reality became apparent. The rocket had landed off course and something outside the ship was blocking the hatch from outside. Kevin's mind raced as he assessed the situation. We need to find another way out. There has to be an emergency exit or another access point. We can't let the flames catch up with us. The lunar surface, once a symbol of exploration, now became the stage for a life and death struggle. Kevin and Zara, in their desperate bid for survival, sought an alternative exit, while both feared in their hearts that the next few moments might be their last. Kevin's repairs to the rocket were successful in keeping it from exploding, but it also allowed oxygen to seep into the cabin. As Kevin and Zara prepare to land on the moon, there is a spark that erupts into an inferno. Kevin gives Zara the controls of the rocket so she can land as he tries to put out the flames. The rocket does land on the moon, but its position means that the hatch is locked shut. Kevin and Zara have only seconds to figure out how to get out of the rocket before they burn to death on the moon. The claustrophobic confines of the Apollo rocket pressed in on Kevin and Zara as they grappled with the unyielding exit hatch. Smoke curled around them, the acrid scent of burning metal in their helmets. The fire, fueled by the influx of oxygen, cracked menacingly. Kevin, Zara cried out. The fire! We can't stop the fire! With the exit hatch stubbornly blocked and the fire still growing within the cabin, Kevin's mind raced for a solution. Time was slipping away, and the urgency of the situation pressed upon them. A desperate idea formed in Kevin's mind. Zara, grab onto something. I'm going to power up the right navigational thruster. The right navigational thruster? Zara repeated. Why? Kevin raced toward the control panel. We're going to tip the whole thing over. Zara's face went pale. She realized what Kevin was suggesting. She braced herself. The decision hung in the air as Kevin initiated the power sequence for the right thruster. The ship rumbled, protesting the sudden tilt, and Zara clung to whatever ledge or pole she could find to steady herself. The lunar landscape tilted into view through the small windows, an unsettling perspective as they prepared for the inevitable descent. Here we go, Kevin shouted as the tall ship began to tip over. The moment of impact was a violent mass of sound and vibration. The lunar soil rushed up to meet them and the ship slammed onto its side with a bone-jarring thud. Inside the cramped module, Kevin and Zara fought against the disorienting force their helmets echoing with the harsh clang of metal against rock. Kevin checked on Zara. Still with me, he called out with concern. Zara threw a thumbs up. Still here, for now. 
With the immediate danger of the fire still growing, Kevin wasted no time. I'm blowing the exit hatch. He grasped onto the release handle and yanked it back. As the hatch was released, the sudden vacuum of the moon sucked the remaining air out of the module. The force of decompression extinguished the fire in a dramatic display, leaving behind a silence that resonated with the weight of their predicament. You did it, Zara exclaimed. You killed the fire. But hopefully not the ship, Kevin noted. The aftermath revealed the havoc wreaked upon their spacecraft. Components dangled precariously, and the once pristine interior now bore massive burns and scars from the lunar descent. Kevin surveyed the damage, the realization settling heavily on his shoulders. This is bad. The ship's in bad shape. I don't know how we're going to make it back home. Kevin made his way over to the control console. Engines are dead. Radio. We can't take off and we can't radio NASA for help. Zara's response, delivered against the backdrop of the lunar tomb, held a flicker of resilience. You'll find a way, Kevin. You always do. The lunar landscape, once a symbol of exploration, now stretched around them as a silent witness to their struggle. The journey to the moon, fraught with unforeseen challenges, had become a test of survival against the cosmic canvas, a stark reminder that the unknown could transform even the most carefully planned missions into a battle for life and a quest for a safe return. At the same time, back on Earth and in Chicago, Lily found herself confined to a hospital bed, a sanctuary of sorts under Dr. Serafina Willow's watchful care. The sterile white walls offered a stark contrast to the chaos that had unfolded at the press conference days earlier. While trying to defend her name and the legitimacy of her pregnancy against her rival Hayden Smart, Lily suffered sudden sharp pains in her stomach and collapsed to the ground. As Rachel, her ever-vigilant campaign manager, turned the pages of several recent newspapers, Lily couldn't escape the scrutiny of the public eye. Rachel, her eyes scanning headlines and articles, looked up with a mixture of relief and concern. Most publications are giving you the benefit of the doubt, Lily. They see through Hayden's manipulative tactics. Finally, Lily sighed, grateful for the support, but burdened by the weight of the public opinion. The hospital room, now transformed into a makeshift war room, echoed with the whispers of strategy and counteraction against the smear campaign led by Hayden Smart. That's good news. Thank you. But let's see what the talking heads are saying. Lily said with a disheartened sigh. With a reluctant hand, Lily picked up the remote and turned on the television. Hayden Smart's smug face filled the screen his words of venomous assault on Lily's character during a one-on-one -on -one review. I wasn't the first person to question Lily Williams' pregnancy, Hayden declared as a way of defending himself while continuing to spread the rumor he had started. I was just bringing to the surface questions other ordinary people I've met along the campaign trail have brought up to me, which is exactly what you want from your elected officials. The reporter continued her questioning. So what are you saying, Mr. Smart? Do you still have reservations about the Williams baby? I have so many questions about Lily Williams. Kevin Williams is a hero and he doesn't deserve the kind of constant backlash his wife seems to bring to their family. Maybe she's really pregnant. Maybe she's not. But that's not the only question. Do we forget that Lily Williams was present at a man's death not more than two weeks ago? What's the connection there? A mayoral candidate is in the same place as a man who could have been murdered. What does that say? How can we trust Lily Williams? Rachel couldn't take it anymore. She took the remote and turned off the tiny TV. Don't listen to him, Lily, Rachel remarked, her voice filled with indignation. He's just doing his best to tarnish your reputation. He's a creep, and people will see through his act eventually. Dr. Serafina Willow entered Lily's hospital room with a soft smile that barely masked the concern in her eyes. Lily, tethered to the hospital bed by various IV drips, looked up with trepidation. Dr. Willow, how's the baby? Lily asked, her voice laced with a vulnerability that only a concerned mother could express. Dr. Willow, a paragon of calm and professionalism, chose her words with utmost care. Lily, 
your pregnancy is going well. All vital signs are within the normal range. Sharp cramps can be normal during this phase of the pregnancy. You have nothing to worry about. A wave of relief washed over Lily, her features softening as the weight of worry lifted, if only for a moment. The hospital room once a battleground of emotions now held the fragile peace. That's wonderful news, Serafina, Lily responded. Thank you so much for always being there for me. Can you tell me more about the baby? Dr. Willow hesitated, the delicate dance of language unfolding. Lily, your, um, next generation is healthy and progressing as expected. Why are you being so vague? Lily asked. Dr. Willow smiled. I'm trying to avoid using specifics, as I don't want to ruin the big surprise at your big gender reveal celebration. So I'll continue to just say that everything is as it should be with your pregnancy. In fact, it's going splendidly, far better than you, Kevin, or I even expected a... Lily, recognizing the need for secrecy, nodded in agreement. You're right, Dr. Willow. Thank you. As Dr. Willow continued her updates on Lily's health and the baby's progress, Lily yearned for a connection with Kevin. As Dr. Willow left the room, Lily's focus turned to Rachel. I want to talk to Kevin. Can we try to contact NASA? Of course, Rachel replied. Just sit tight. I'll make the call. Rachel dialed the number and handed the phone over to Lily. Lily was overcome with a sense of joyful anticipation. However, the line remained eerily silent, denying her the comfort of her beloved husband Kevin's voice. No one's answering, Lily commented. Let's try Stanley Cooper at the Reaper Squad headquarters in Washington. Rachel nodded and made the call. Frustration crept into Lily's tone as Stanley Cooper, the Reaper agent and longtime ally of Kevin's, picked up the phone. Stanley, it's Lily Williams. I've been trying to reach NASA but haven't gotten a response. Are there any updates on Kevin's space flight? There was a pause on the other end, a heavy sigh cutting through the air. Lily, there's been an incident on the surface of the moon. We may have a problem. The words hung in the room like a storm cloud. Lily's heart raced, a sense of dread settling over her. In the midst of her own turmoil, the realization dawned that the chaos surrounding her might extend far beyond the confines of Earth. As Lily braced for a revelation from Stanley, the delicate balance between her personal turmoil and the cosmic unknown threatened to unravel. Lily feared that Stanley might be about to tell her the worst news any wife in love could possibly hear. On the moon, Kevin had to use some of the rocket's own power functions to ignite so the module could tip off, and thus free Kevin and Zara who were trapped inside because the hatch was locked shut. Meanwhile, back in Chicago, Lily has learned that all is going just fine with her pregnancy, according to friend and Dr. Serafina Willow. But when she tries to contact Kevin through NASA, she is told by Stanley Cooper of the Reaper Squad that there's been an unexpected event on the moon and that Kevin is in trouble. The lunar surface stretched before Kevin and Zara like an alien landscape bathed in an ethereal glow. As they emerged from the lunar module, the vastness of space and the desolation of the moon unfolded around them. Zara, her eyes wide with wonder, couldn't contain her amazement. Wow, she breathed, her voice crackling over the intercom. The moon! Kevin joined her in marveling at the extraterrestrial scenery. The earth hung in the cosmic void, a distant oasis against the stark backdrop of the moon's surface. We made it, Kevin whispered, grateful. Now let's just hope we can make it back. As Zara descended the escape ladder, a sharp pain shot through her arm. As she grimaced, clutching it instinctively, Kevin, she cried. Kevin rushed down the ladder and to her side, concern etching lines on his face. What is it, Zara? My arm. Something's wrong with my arm, Zara admitted, doing her best to calm her breath. Kevin, his astronaut training kicking in and combining with his knowledge of the human body and its functions, examined her arm with a careful touch. This isn't right. We need to get you back inside and set a splint. Can you make it? With a nod, Zara followed Kevin back into the lunar module. She looked back at the surface of the moon one last time before she finally re-entered the ship. The familiar hiss of the hatch ceiling shut echoed through the confined space. 
As they re-entered the spacecraft, the lunar landscape faded from view, replaced by the sterile surroundings of the module. Kevin, relying on his knowledge of herbalism and his extensive study of medical procedures, improvised a makeshift splint for Zara's injured arm. The lunar module, designed for exploration rather than life-saving medical care, lacked the resources for comprehensive treatment. Nevertheless, Kevin's expertise proved invaluable in addressing the immediate issue. We'll need to be cautious with that arm, Kevin advised, his concern evident in his eyes. I'm sorry, Kevin, Zara offered. I must have broken it during our rocky landing. My adrenaline was pumping so hard I didn't even notice. It's not your fault, Zara, Kevin replied. We're all just doing our best to survive this mission with little training in a somewhat rickety rocket but you need to take it easy for a bit. That's not an option, Zara countered. Suit communication still works, but our long-range radio is down. Navigation control is down. The fire took out most of our core systems. That's why you need to stay here, take it easy, and do your best to get that long-range radio back online, Kevin replied with a calm assuredness. Zara nodded in understanding. On it. What are you going to do? Kevin's focus turned to the escape hatch. I'm going after Zip. Despite the unforeseen setback, the rescue mission pressed forward. The lunar surface with its desolate beauty stretched out before Kevin as he prepared to embark on the search for Zip Merlot. The astronaut NASA had left to live on the moon for 50 years to save Earth from potential contamination. The coordinates indicated that Zip fell unconscious about a mile away a relatively short distance on Earth, but a significant journey on the moon. Zara, I'm heading out to find Zip. Let me know if you're able to reach NASA. Kevin radioed through his space helmet. Got it, Kevin. Be careful out there, Zara replied, her voice steady over the intercom. Kevin's boots made contact with the moon. Stationed nearby was an outdated lunar rover covered in moon dust. There's a rover out here, Kevin radioed to Zara. I'm going to see if I can get it up and running. It's obviously old, and I doubt that Zip has been using it for a few decades. Copy that, Zara responded. Kevin, undeterred by the challenges of the lunar surface, found himself seated in the dusty interior of the outdated 1970s-era lunar rover. Its mechanical components, frozen in time, awaited the touch of Kevin's hands, which had only recently been put through space camp training. And though Kevin awed the NASA officials with his ability to learn the processes in a fraction of the time most of the astronauts took, getting an ancient moon rover up and running was not going to be an easy task even for him. With a determined spirit, Kevin jump-started the rover's engine, the antiquated machine rumbling to life with a stream of sounds echoing in the lunar vacuum. I've got life in here. The engine can still purr, Kevin noted. The rover, a relic from a bygone era of moon exploration, possessed a charm that transcended its age. As Kevin explored interior, a weathered copy of Life magazine from 1971 caught his eye, signed by none other than Rod Serling from the Twilight Zone. The artifact spoke of a time when lunar exploration was still in its infancy, a poignant reminder of the progress made since. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Kevin quipped as he powered the rover forward. It amused Kevin to feel as though he was both making great progress in his quest and crawling over the moon's surface in a 50-year-old dust-covered rover that was moving at the pace of about 80 miles per hour. The pace gave Kevin time to think and to think about the odd journey behind him and the difficulties that lay ahead. He had to find Quentin Covington and bring down whatever evil plot he had concocted. And despite all that Kevin had learned, he still didn't know the extent of what Quentin's scheme was and how it would affect the Earth and the Foundation. As Kevin ventured further into the lunar landscape, his eyes scanned the horizon for any sign of Zip Merlot's presence. The moon, with its silent craters and sprawling plains, held its secrets close, and Kevin felt the weight of the unknown pressing in on him. Meanwhile, Zara worked inside the old Apollo rocket. The confined space transformed into a makeshift workshop as she assessed the damage to the ship. Her first priority was the radio, a lifeline to Earth and NASA. You can do this, 
Zara whispered to herself, trying to boost her confidence. She made her way over to the tool chest and opened it up. To Zara's delight, the tools floated in the low-gravity environment. With her arms still in a splint, Zara went to work. She dismantled the core. With methodical precision, she examined each piece, identifying the points of failure. The delicate dance of repairs unfolded as Zara worked against the backdrop of the lunar module's interior. The hum of machinery filled the air as Zara began the intricate process of bringing the radio back to life. It was a race against time, with the success of the mission hinging on their ability to reestablish communication with NASA. Outside, Kevin pressed on in his search for Zip Merlot. The moon's surface, bathed in the cold glow of cosmic light, held the promise of discovery and the lingering shadows of uncertainty. As Kevin pushed the outdated rover forward, the lunar landscape unfolded before him. The low-gravity environment allowed for a light and bouncy ride. The wheels of the rover churned up lunar dust as Kevin made his way across the barren surface, the hum of the engine echoing through the silent expanse. Nice and smooth, Kevin repeated over and over again, doing his best to will the old rover onward. Kevin checked the map. He was still half a mile from Zip's camp and the unconscious astronaut. The lunar surface was quiet, Kevin alone in the middle of nowhere. There was something peaceful about the experience. However, the tranquility was shattered by an odd alarm that went off inside the rover. Kevin looked around to see what the problem could be. His eyes darted over multiple switches and components before spotting the cause of the unexpected siren. Proximity alert. Kevin read on the flashing alert button. Kevin suddenly realized what it meant. Something was coming. Kevin looked up to spy an unexpected sight on the lunar horizon. Floating in the air, a bizarre-looking ship emerged, its silhouette casting an ominous shadow against the cosmic backdrop. Kevin's eyes went wide. He was not alone on the moon. As the tiny flying drone approached, it grew in size. It wasn't a small ship. It was something massive. What is that? Kevin exclaimed. Before he could react, the drone unleashed a barrage of gunfire, the lunar dust erupting in plumes of smoke and debris. The drone was shooting at Kevin on the surface of the moon. Kevin swerved the rover, desperately seeking cover from the onslaught. The antiquated vehicle rattled with each impact. It couldn't take much more than this. As he continued to maneuver, Kevin radioed Zara. Zara, come in. I'm under attack. There's something out here. The intercom crackled to life as Zara's voice filled Kevin's ears. Under attack? Kevin, what's happening out there? Are you okay? The drone fired again. The rover took multiple hits. All kinds of alerts and alarms started to beep as Kevin pushed the throttle forward, doing anything and everything he could to get clear of the drone. As Kevin maneuvered the rover through the lunar battlefield, the ship continued its assault. The celestial dance of discovery had morphed into a desperate pursuit, a fight for survival on the desolate surface of the moon. After tipping over the rocket so the hatch could be opened, Kevin and Zara merged onto the moon's surface. But Zara realized her arm was broken in the chaos. While Zara stayed behind to start repairs on the rocket's standard communication system, Kevin took an old lunar rover to try and find Zip. But as the rover rolled out, a high-tech drone appeared on the horizon and opened fire on Kevin. The lunar rover, a relic from a bygone era, rattled across the moon's surface, pursued by the sleek and advanced-looking space drone. Zara radioed from the Apollo rocket. Kevin, I heard something. Tiny blasts. What's happening out there? I'm being chased by some kind of drone. It's already open fire, Kevin replied. I'm going to try to lose it. Kevin attempted evasive maneuvers, weaving through the lunar landscape around moon rocks and into and out of various craters. The advanced capabilities of the drone far surpassed the outdated rover. It effortlessly matched each move, closing the distance with little effort, considering that the moon rover was moving almost as slowly as a turtle could walk. No good. Kevin radioed. Whatever this thing is, it's fast. As Kevin's mind raced for a solution, a spark of ingenuity lit within him. Zara, I'm going to try something, he called out into his helmet. 
be careful, Zara replied, her concern growing. In a daring move, Kevin unscrewed the bottom hatch of the rover and pushed it down, causing it to scrape the moon's surface. The lunar dirt stirred in the rover's wake, creating a trail of moon dust. Good luck seeing through that, Kevin called out as he continued to power the rover forward. The drone, equipped with superior navigational sensors, effortlessly avoided the cloud of moon dust. Kevin's expression sank. Shoot! Realizing he needed a more cunning plan, Kevin began steering the rover in tight circles, creating a swirling cloud of lunar dust. The fine particles filled the low-gravity air, obscuring both the rover and the drone from view. The drone, unable to navigate through the thickening dust, hovered in a holding pattern, waiting for a clear visual. The lunar rover, now an indistinct silhouette in the swirling mist, became a phantom in the lunar expanse. The intercom crackled with Zara's anxious voice. Are you all right? Kevin, maintaining his circular trajectory within the lunar dust halo, replied with cautious optimism. I've created a dust cloud that can't see me. I'm going to try to lose it in the haze. As the drone circled the cloud of moon dust, the rover made a daring break for freedom. The drone, momentarily disoriented, adjusted its course and resumed the pursuit. As the rover sped across the moon's surface, the drone recalibrated its strategy. It deployed a new weapon, a massive magnet on a long chain. The first shot, a formidable attempt to ensnare the rover, narrowly missed as Kevin deftly swerved at the last possible moment. Undeterred, the drone persists in its magnetic assault, firing the magnet repeatedly. The lunar landscape echoed with the metallic clanks as the magnet shot toward the rover. Kevin, acutely aware of the threat, skillfully dodged each attempt. With precise timing, the drone's magnet finally found its mark, attaching to the rover with a resounding thud. The lunar rover, now tethered to the drone by the unyielding force of the magnet, was at the mercy of its pursuer. It's got me, Kevin radioed Zara. The drone, slowing its pace, exerted a forceful tug, attempting to bring the lunar rover to a complete stop. I'm hooked by a massive magnet, Kevin continued to relay into his helmet radio. The drone is trying to pull me in. What are you going to do? Zara replied, panicked. Kevin determined to break free up the rover's throttle. The magnet held firm as the drone continued to pull the rover to a complete stop. As the drone continued to exert its control, a sinister revelation unfolded. With a mechanical whir, the drone's chest compartment opened, revealing a horrifying sight. A million deadly saws. The lunar vacuum echoed with the ominous hum of the drone's concealed arsenal. Kevin, gripping the rover's controls with determination, assessed the dire situation. The saws, gleaming with evil intent, waited to shred the rover to pieces. With a surge of adrenaline, Kevin sought a solution. It's trying to pull the rover into a maze of razor-sharp saws, Kevin radioed to Zara. It's going to tear the rover into scrap. The lunar landscape bore witness to a dangerous dance of destruction as the drone, relentless in its pursuit, pulled the lunar rover closer to its lethal array of saws. The million gleaming blades grew larger and larger, ready to tear through the rover's metallic shell and through its solitary occupant. The intercom crackled with Zara's desperate plea. Kevin, get out of there! Zara's cry gave Kevin an idea. In the face of imminent danger, Kevin had one option. The lunar rover, tethered by the unyielding force of the massive magnet, edged closer to the drone's malevolent sauce. With the drone saws mere inches away, Kevin activated the rover's self-destruct mechanism. The clock began ticking. Ten, nine, eight, seven. The drone, unaware of the imminent danger, continued its response. At the last possible moment, Kevin blew the rover's escape hatch and jumped out onto the lunar floor. The drone sucked the rover into its saw just as the self-destruct hit zero. With a resounding boom that echoed across the lunar expanse, the rover detonated in a spectacular burst of debris. The force of the explosion rippled through the low-gravity environment, sending shockwaves across the silent surface. The drone, caught in the blast radius, 
disintegrated into a cosmic symphony of destruction. Its million saws, once set to create mayhem, were now scattered across the moon, their lethal intent thwarted by the calculated sacrifice of the lunar rover. As the debris settled on the moon's surface, the outcome of the lunar struggle became clear. The rover, now a fragmentary testament to Kevin's resourcefulness, had taken the drone down with it. A new crater formed in the wake of the destructive battle. Kevin lay on the ground in his spacesuit, grateful to be alive. Zara, we did it! Kevin radioed back to the Apollo rocket. The drone was destroyed. We're safe. The explosive aftermath of the rover's self-destruction left a momentary sense of relief. As the drone shattered into a million pieces, the lunar landscape seemed to settle into an eerie calm. However, the illusion of safety was quickly shattered. From within the wreckage of the drone, a new threat emerged. A robotic pilot crawled out from the debris. Kevin watched as the metal arms of a deadly mech warrior climbed out from the newly formed crater. Its metal body was singed and dented its eyes red. It was damaged and angry. A relentless fusion of artificial intelligence and cold calculating metal, the robotic pilot fixed its gaze on Kevin. Its purpose was clear. Terminate this enemy. Kevin's relief evaporated into a renewed sense of urgency. The lunar vacuum echoed with the metallic footsteps of the robotic pilot as it engaged in a foot chase along the barren surface. Kevin, propelled by the low-gravity environment, raced against the relentless pursuit. The lunar landscape, once a theater of cosmic confrontation, now bore witness to a cat-and-mouse game between man and machine. Kevin, dodging and weaving through the lunar landscape, sought refuge from the unyielding gaze of the mechanical adversary. Zara! Kevin radioed, his breath labored. The drone pilot! It's a mech warrior! It's after me! Run, Kevin! Zara screamed. Run! Zara's words hit Kevin, but not the way she intended. Kevin realized that all he had been doing was running. First from the drone, now from this mechanical monster. Growing tired from the continued pursuit, Kevin finally decided that it was time to quit running. He slowed to a stop, turned to fight. Let's finish this, Kevin called out as the robot warrior approached. Kevin, armed with a moon rock, engaged in a fierce battle with the robotic Terminator. The low-gravity environment lent a surreal quality to the fight, each move to the laws of earthly physics. Kevin, a level 7 fighter even in this cosmic arena, but one who was not used to altering his talents to battle a robot, utilized his skills to smash the robot into submission. Moon rocks, once mere artifacts of the lunar landscape, became weapons in the hands of an intrepid explorer defending himself against his mechanical adversary. The robot fell back and Kevin focused all his strength on the final assault. He smashed his moon rock into the robot's face over and over again until the metal man stopped moving altogether. Kevin had done it. He had beaten the machine. Breathing heavily, Kevin surveyed the battlefield, victorious yet wary. The intercom crackled to life with Zara's concerned voice. Kevin, are you okay? What was that thing? Kevin, still catching his breath, replied, Fine. I'm fine. Now. Just then, Kevin noticed something new. On the fallen robot's chest plate was a name, inscribed, the Anata. Recognition flickered in Kevin's eyes. The pieces fell into place, revealing a startling revelation. Q Covington's girlfriend, Anada, Kevin muttered to himself. The connection clicked in his mind. Quentin Covington has some sort of presence here on the moon. Now I'm positive of that. The lunar landscape, once a battleground, now held the traces of a hidden adversary. Kevin, fueled by the urgency of his mission, realized that the pieces of the puzzle were falling in place. Quentin Covington, the elusive architect of the moon's mysteries, was closer than ever before. As Kevin prepared to continue his lunar journey, the revelation lingered in the air like a question waiting to be answered. The secrets of the moon and twin enigma of Quentin Covington awaited their unveiling in the cosmic theater of exploration. Kevin's battle with the killer drone that intended to saw him into little pieces ends when Kevin brings down the drone. 
and then battles a mechanical assassin that Kevin defeats. Kevin sees that the mechanical contraption is called the Anada, and he remembers the name of Q. Covington's girlfriend in Tokyo. Kevin now has evidence that Quentin Covington has some sort of pressure on the moon, and Kevin knows it cannot be one that will be beneficial to Earth and the Foundation. The lunar landscape stretched out before Kevin, a vast expanse of desolation orbiting around the cold glow of Earth. With the defeated robotic pilot left in the dust and the remnants of the lunar rover scattered across the surface, Kevin's focus shifted to the mission's original objective, finding stranded astronaut Zip Murlot. Walking across the moon's surface, Kevin covered almost half a mile when he stumbled upon the makeshift outpost that Zip Murlot had fashioned for himself over the past five decades. The camp stood as a testament to resourcefulness, pieced together from whatever Zip had salvaged or found on the barren lunar plains. Zip Murlot, left behind after the Apollo 17 mission, had carved out a life in the lunar solitude, using his wits and whatever basic resources were available, as well as the yearly shipments of supplies from NASA. It was the least NASA could do to supply him with some sort of comfort, since the organization had decided to leave him on the moon after realizing he was contaminated with a virus that could easily spread through the Foundation should he be allowed to return to Earth. Kevin was impressed. Tents were scattered across the landscape, stitched together from mylar sails and reinforced with mounds of moon rocks. They stood resilient against the lunar vacuum. Their muted silver hues blended seamlessly with the gray dusty surface creating a ghostly mirage of human habitation on an alien frontier. Amid the tents were relics of past lunar missions, old satellites repurposed and transformed into sheds and sleeping quarters. These remnants of space travel history stood as silent witnesses to the passage of time and the evolution of the lunar outpost. On the lunar surface, Zip had dug dozens of lunar caverns, providing shelter and protection from the harsh cosmic elements when needed. Zip Murlot, the lone inhabitant of this lunar sanctuary, had burrowed into the moon's surface, carving out subterranean spaces that offered refuge against any possible lunar extreme. Stacks of oxygen tanks glinted in the reflected sunlight. Each tank, a lifeline in the void, bore the marks of years spent in solitude. Nearby, supplies of water carefully stored in sealed containers provided a precious resource in the water-scarce lunar environment. Stacks of space food in old magazines could also be seen. It was clear NASA had, as they assured Kevin, been sending supplies for years to Zip, and he had done his best to stack and store them all. The air carried a faint hum of machinery, the remnants of life-sustaining systems cobbled together from salvaged equipment. Solar panels, their surfaces scratched and faded, captured precious sunlight to power the outpost essential systems. In the midst of this lunar homestead, Kevin spotted Zip Murlot lying unconscious, covered in a cloud of moon dust. The astronaut, who had lived through half a century of lunar isolation, was a living testament to human resilience against the vastness of space. Or Kevin worried, was he a dead testament to it? Zip! Kevin's voice, muffled by the spacesuit, carried across the lunar expanse. The astronaut's still form lay silent as Kevin raced toward him. Zara, Kevin called into his radio. I see Zip. I'm going to engage. Be careful, Kevin, Zara responded with concern. Remember, he's got a rare lunar disease. Understood. Rushing to Zip's side, Kevin's gloved hands worked with urgency. Zip was unconscious, his eyes shut. But was he dead? Kevin quickly checked Zip's oxygen level. It was in the red but still pumping. Kevin was relieved to realize that Zip was still alive. He still got air, Kevin relayed to Zara back in the Apollo rocket. But he's in the red. I've got to get him to shelter fast. The veteran astronaut was almost out of air, the thin thread of life that connected Zip to the lunar expanse on the brink of snapping. Kevin's eyes darted around the camp. Zip needed air, and Kevin needed to be able to remove Zip's spacesuit in order to administer first aid. In the proximity of the lunar outpost, a small space capsule stood as a silent witness to years of lunar survival. 
Its metallic exterior had an airtight seal and its own supply of oxygen. Kevin realized this was his only hope. With careful precision, Kevin moved Zip into the capsule. Kevin sealed the hatch behind him and lay Zip down on the metal floor. Removing Zip's spacesuit revealed the toil of lunar survival. Long hair cascaded around a haggard face adorned with an unkempt beard. The astronaut, once a symbol of clean-cut human exploration through NASA, appeared weathered by the lunar solitude. Lines etched by time and isolation traced the contours of Zip's face. Kevin worked to bring Zip back from the verge of death. Come on, Zip, Kevin whispered. You've made it this far. Just go a little further. Stay with us. In the claustrophobic confines of Zip's lunar capsule, Kevin's satchel became a repository of potential salvation. Kevin extracted a power pill for general health alongside a lunar phoenix pill, an elixir specifically engineered to fortify Zip's bones against the long-term effects of weightlessness in space. As Kevin administered the pills, a subtle transformation unfurled within Zip almost instantaneously. The blood began to flow back into his veins, and his cheeks regained some of their color. He was still unconscious, but his breathing became less labored. The pills were working. It was then that Kevin took note of the bigger problem. Zip's skin was green and bubbly, horrific in appearance. NASA Chief Warren Greenleaf had warned Kevin that the reason they left Zip behind in the first place, back in 1972, was because Zip had contracted a deadly moon disease, the likes of which had never been seen before or since. Let me see if I can help you, Kevin muttered to himself, hopeful and focused. In the confined quarters of the lunar capsule, Kevin's determination to unravel the mystery of Zip's ailment took center stage. With the resourcefulness of a lunar detective, he transformed the capsule into a makeshift lab, ready to dissect the secrets hidden beneath Zip's enigmatic illness. I'm gonna run some temp skin, Kevin radioed back to Zara, who was still trying to repair the retrofitted Apollo they had used to land on the moon. Copy that, Kevin, Zara replied. I've got thrusters back online, but I'm still working on getting the long-range radio back up and running. Stay on it, Kevin replied. The sooner we can talk to NASA, the sooner we can tell them everything we've already discovered up here. Absolutely, Zara confirmed as she ended the transmission. Taking a sample of Zip's green-tinged skin, Kevin embarked on a meticulous journey of analysis. The lunar capsule, once a sanctuary against the cosmic unknown, now bore witness to a scientific endeavor fueled by the urgency of discovery. Under the sterile light of improvised equipment, Kevin subjected the sample to a battery of chemical analyses, desperate to decode the cosmic puzzle concealed within Zip's affliction. As the results materialized, Kevin's brow furrowed in contemplation. The green skin, once a cause for concern, revealed itself not as an extraterrestrial illness, but as a terrestrial consequence. It's a rash, Kevin noted to himself. It's just a simple rash. The lunar isolation, it seemed, had been an unwitting consequence of an unforeseen allergic reaction. Examining Zip's old spacesuit, Kevin identified the culprit. Cotton. The very fabric meant to protect Zip from the lunar void had turned into an unwitting antagonist. Fifty years of lunar solitude had been the unintended consequence of an allergic reaction to the material encasing him. He's not sick, Kevin relayed to Zara. He just had a bad reaction to cotton. This was fifty years ago, and I'm sure everything seems scarier because it was happening on the surface of the moon, but Zip's skin issue could be cured with a simple cream from any local pharmacy. That poor man, Zara replied. Fifty years alone on the moon just because they didn't know, because they were scared. In the lunar capsule, the revelation hung in the air like a cosmic exhale. Zip's predicament, initially shrouded in lunar mystery, now lay exposed as a consequence of a simple earthly allergy. The lunar landscape, vast and indifferent, had played host to a human drama shaped by unforeseen terrestrial factors. Well, Kevin offered, we're here now and hopefully once Zip is back up on his feet and has helped us find Quentin Covington's secret base, we can help him do the one thing I'm sure he wants to do the most. Finally, return to Earth. 
With this newfound understanding, Kevin's mission acquired a renewed sense of purpose. Kevin needed to save the world. He had to defeat Quentin Covington. He had to protect Lily and their unborn baby. And he had to make sure aging astronaut Zip Murlock could finally find his way home. After their moon landing didn't go quite as planned, Kevin patched up Zara, who had a broken arm. He then left her with the rocket to make repairs while Kevin continued on in his quest to find Zip Murlot. Zip was the astronaut NASA had to leave on the moon more than 50 years ago because he was suspected of contracting a highly contagious space disease. Kevin recognized Zip's disease as nothing more than an allergic reaction to a spacesuit. Using his herbal knowledge, Kevin cured Zip of his rash and now hopes to continue on to the dark side of the moon to locate Quentin Covington's sixth and final outpost in the last piece to the mysterious blueprint. Zip Murlot lay unconscious on the floor of his tiny, cramped space capsule. Kevin gently patted his cheeks. Although the old astronaut looked like he might be dead, Kevin knew he had only passed out. For 50 years, Zip had been suffering from terrible itching all over most of his body. When Kevin was able to counteract his body's allergic reaction to a spacesuit, the relief from the epidural irritation was so great that Zip's central nervous system had essentially shorted out. And he was again unconscious, though this time not from the constant pain of his itching, but from relief. After a few more gentle pats, Zip shook his head and sat up. Those are some far out pills you concocted for me, man, Zip told Kevin. I feel like I'm 68 again without all that infernal itching driving me up the wall. Who are you, dude? I'm so happy I could help you, Kevin replied, and now I'm hoping that you'll be able to help me as well. My name is Kevin Williams. The NASA chief, Worm Greenleaf, helped me to come here in an old Apollo rocket so I could find the outpost on the dark side of the moon where I think an evil genius is creating something that might threaten the existence of the Earth and the Foundation. I think you're the man who can help out what that is. Yeah, man. That would be groovy to be able to help someone again. I'll make groceries while you and I share more deets. Kevin took that to mean that Zip would make them something to eat while Kevin asked questions and got details from Zip. Zip puttered around the small space. He opened compartments built into the side of the craft and took out packets and powders. I'm interested in anything you can tell me about the activity coming from the dark side of the moon. Kevin began. I don't know much about what happens over there on the flip side. Zip turned a small faucet and then steaming hot water poured into the valve on a sealed plastic pouch. Dehydrated rice and some bright orange fuzzy powder began floating inside. Zip gave the pouch a hard shake. When all this space junk started turning up, I figured that NASA had started doing manned missions to this rock again. But if you thought that there were other humans on the moon, Kevin began, why didn't you go to them for help? It was the itching, you see. Zip took another sealed plastic pouch and added water. More orange powder could be seen floating in the pouch. The seal must have been compromised, though, because the smell of chemical oranges filled the tiny space capsule. As long as I thought I might be contagious, I tried to steer clear of any other humans. I didn't want anybody else to wind up stranded out here on this rock. Not that I would have minded the company. Zip's expression got sad and far away. Kevin felt for the lonely old astronaut and admired his integrity. Must have been difficult being alone for so long, so far from home. But Zip still tried to keep his fellow astronauts safe. Just that made him a hero in Kevin's book. So you really had no idea what was going on on the other side of the moon, Kevin pushed. Well, the old astronaut looked a little cagey. I won't say that I didn't at least try to have a bit of a look-see over there. I can only watch rerun so many times and the change of scenery did me some good. Kevin leaned forward. This was exactly the kind of thing he needed to know. That's more like it, Kevin encouraged Zip handed Kevin the two packets. They were identical, except that one had rice floating in an orange sauce, and the other one just seemed to have orange goop inside of it. Well, the first thing I noticed before I could see anything was the music. It came blaring over the radio waves every now and again. 
But sometimes I could hear it through my suit, too. What kind of an asked? It was kind of weird, Zip frowned. Not like anything I'd ever heard before. Upbeat and bouncy, but still kind of weird. Zip hummed a few bars of a jaunty tune. It took Kevin several minutes, but then he recognized it. Zip sat down with his own pouches and glanced away from Kevin, embarrassed. At times, I thought the music might not be real at all. It might be something my own brain was making up just to try to keep me company. It did have a rather friendly sound to it. Kevin smiled. You're right about that. The tune Zip had hummed was the theme song from the TV show Friends. But I can promise you, Zip, that you weren't having an auditory hallucination, and you didn't make that song up. It's one I recognize. It was popular on Earth maybe 25 years ago. Zip looked relieved. At least I know that's real then. There was other stuff too, though I could have sworn I saw figures in the distance. Sometimes they seemed to be watching me. I wasn't sure if they were actual astronauts keeping their distance because of my little problem, or if maybe I was making those up as well. I doubt that was the case either, Kevin assured him. When Zip motioned for Kevin to eat, Kevin tried the contents of the pouch with rice. That, at least, he could identify. It turned out to be a salty slurry of something vaguely familiar. Is this rice a Kevin asked. Yup, Zip nodded. The cutting edge of space cuisine. Try the other one. Kevin sipped from the other pouch. The liquid was gritty and there was the same smell of chemical oranges. And this is, uh... It was really unlike anything Kevin had ever tasted before. It's Tang, Zip declared. I'm not surprised you never had it before. I bet they keep it special for us astronauts. That is one possible explanation, Kevin said diplomatically. He didn't want to hurt the astronauts' feelings when he had been so generous, sharing his supplies with Kevin. When they finished their food, Kevin leaned forward again. Here's the thing, Zip. There's something bad happening on the dark side of the moon really bad. I think it might affect not just the USA, but the whole world and all the people on Earth. That's terrible, Zip exclaimed. But I'm here to stop it, Kevin continued, and I'm going to need your help to do it. You know the moon better than any other human who ever lived. I want you to come with me to the dark side of the moon and help me figure out and stop whatever is going on there. The old astronaut sat up straighter and saluted, Kevin could see the daring test pilot that he had once been. It would be my honor. Back at the rocket that Kevin and Zara had arrived on the moon in, Zara was struggling to restore communications. It was difficult working with just one arm. Kevin had splinted the broken bone through Zara's spacesuit and had given her an herbal remedy to help her with the pain. The problem was that there were some things she just needed two hands for, like typing efficiently. Finally, the diagnostic program that Zara had been running finished. She examined the results. The communication system was working fine within the rocket itself. The problem was that the flat antenna attached to the side of the rocket that received and sent transmissions back to mission control in Cape Canaveral was currently being blocked by something. That something was outside the rocket ship, which meant Zara was going to have to leave the safety of the rocket in order to correct the problem. Kevin was counting on Zara to re-establish communications, and she wasn't going to let him down, no matter how awkward or difficult it was. She was able to do up her spacesuit with the long zipper tab with no problem. Putting on her space helmet one-handed was a challenge. Finally, she was able to palm the heavy helmet and scoop it onto her head. Getting it latched into place was another obstacle. Finally, Zara had to wedge her head against a wall hold the helmet in place with one hand and turn the rest of her body carefully to get the airtight seal to engage. At last ready, she made her way out of the airlock and carefully descended onto the moon's surface. Here, the lesser gravity helped her move. Still, she had to be careful not to be too enthusiastic and overshoot her destination. She made her way to the antenna's location and found it was buried under a massive pile of rocks. No wonder they weren't able to send or receive any signals. Zara was able to scrape away the smaller bits of rubble with her one good hand, but under all of those pebbles was a heavy moon boulder. She pushed and shoved at it, but could not get enough leverage with just one hand to make any real movement happen. 
Her only choice was to wedge the shoulder of her broken arm against the rock and heave with the rest of her body. It was awkward, and her feet had difficulty gaining traction between the low gravity and the fine powdery moon dust. At last, she found a way to wedge herself into the space enough and heave the rock free, but Zara's over-enthusiasm again betrayed her. She lost her balance and hurtled into the side of the rocket. With the dull crunch, she felt dislocated at the shoulder. Zara realized in that instant that her stubborn need to prove her independence to Kevin might have made their already dangerous mission one that had ever more impossible odds of succeeding. Kevin suspected Quentin Covington's sixth and final outpost and the last piece to the mysterious blueprint were on the dark side of the moon. He and Zara traveled to the moon in a recommissioned NASA rocket ship, but a rough landing left Zara with a broken arm and the ship's communications cut off from NASA ground control. After splinting Zara's arm, Kevin left her to fix their communications and went to locate Zip Murlot. Zip was the astronaut NASA had to leave on the moon more than 50 years ago because he was suspected of contracting a highly contagious space disease. Kevin recognized Zip's disease as nothing more than an allergic reaction to his spacesuit and healed him. As soon as Zip agreed to accompany Kevin on his quest to locate Quentin Covington's outpost on the dark side of the moon, Kevin tapped his communicator to let Zara know that he was heading back with the old astronaut. Fortunately, their short-range radios had not been affected by the damage to the rocket ship. Zara, this is Kevin. I have located Commander Zip Murlot and he is coming back to the rocket ship with me. Zara's voice came back over the radio. Even through the static, Kevin could tell that she was in some distress. That's great to hear, Kevin. I've got communications back up. You will be able to contact NASA Mission Control in Cape Canaveral as soon as you return. Is something wrong? Kevin asked, concern in his voice. I can tell you're in more pain than you should be from the way that you sound, Zara. Sometimes you're too smart for my own good, Kevin. It's nothing that won't weigh you to get back. Zara replied before signing off. Kevin knew it would be faster to get back to the rocket ship than to argue with Zara. He would just have to trust her and take her at her work. Kevin and Zip hurried into their spacesuits and got into the lunar rover Kevin had repaired. They bounced over the surface of the moon as Kevin pushed the lunar rover to its top speed of more than eight miles an hour. You didn't tell me you brought a young lady with you, Zip exclaimed as they zipped along. Kevin eyed the old astronaut. Zip had been stranded alone on the surface of the moon more than 50 years. I know you've been alone for a long time, Zip, but I hope you're not going to show Zara any disrespect. Zip looked offended. I am able to appreciate youth, beauty, and brains as much as this guy, Kevin, but I'm still an officer and a gentleman. That's what I'd like to hear, Kevin replied. They made record time back to the rocket ship. Kevin quickly ran through the protocols that allowed them to enter through the airlock and into the rocket ship's command center. There he found Zara sitting at a command station still in her full spacesuit. The rocket allowed for the circulation of oxygen through the main parts of the cabin, so she didn't need to be wearing the cumbersome suit. Kevin hurried to Zara. What are you doing in your suit, Zara? I had to go outside to clear the radio antenna, Zara explained. I could get into the suit with one hand, but I can't get back out of it now, especially since I just hurt my shoulder. You didn't have to moonwalk by yourself, Kevin scolded her. You could have waited for me to come back. I wanted to re-establish communications as soon as possible, Zara retorted. Everyone back on Earth will be so worried, Kevin, especially Lily. A lot of worry can't be good for her or for the baby. Kevin relieved Zara of her space helmet and gave her a quick examination. I appreciate you considering Lily's feelings, he told her, but I think Lily is better able to cope than even I have given her credit for. Zara's shoulder wasn't broken as Zara feared, but it was dislocated, and a simple procedure would correct it. Kevin quickly reset the shoulder and gave Zara another herbal pill to help it heal faster. In minutes, Zara was smiling, the pain on her face gone. Kevin, you are amazing. I can't believe how much better I feel already. I can agree with you there, added Zip. 
It had been a scant hour since Kevin had cured the allergic reaction that had caused Zip to suffer a terrible, itchy rash for 50 years. The relief was still so amazing, Zip felt like he could leap tall moon boulders in a single bound. Kevin thumbed the radio on and put in a call to Cape Canaveral. Mission Control, this is Kevin Williams reporting in. It was a rough landing, but we're all okay here and have now re-established radio contact. We've also located Commander Zip Murlot. I'm happy to report his space virus was just an allergic reaction. Roger, Kevin Williams. The reply came back. Kevin recognized the voice. It was Stanley Cooper of the Reaper Squad. That's great news about Commander Murlot. Hold on for a minute while we patch you through to Chicago. There's a lady there who's very anxious to hear from you. Lily paced her hospital room. She had been brought to the hospital after fainting at the press conference announcing that she would be running for mayor of Chicago, while also countering the lies that opponent Hayden Smart had been telling the voters about her marriage and her pregnancy. She had felt fine as soon as she had come into the hospital and gotten the all clear from friend and medic Dr. Serafina Willow. Lily had immediately gotten to work trying to combat the rumors that were plaguing her candidacy. Not only did Hayden Smart accuse her of not being pregnant at all, there were also whispers that either she or Kevin had been involved in the death of her friend Nancy's abusive ex-boyfriend and baby daddy, Sid Mangolia. From there, the rumors continued to spin out into more and more ludicrous tales. Lily had just begun to feel like she had everything under control until she had gotten word from Agent Stanley Cooper that something had gone terribly wrong with Kevin's spaceship. Since then, Lily hadn't been able to sit still for more than a minute. Suddenly, her friend and campaign manager, Rachel, rushed into the room, her cell phone in her hand. Lily, it's Kevin. I have Kevin on the phone. Lily took the phone from Rachel. Kevin, is that you? Can you hear me? I can hear you, came back Kevin's voice, although the connection was terrible and his voice was distant and staticky. Are you okay, Lily? They told me you're in the hospital. What's going on? How are you? And the baby? Lily was so relieved she began to laugh and cry at the same time. We're fine, Kevin. Everything's fine now that I know that you're okay. I'm so glad to hear that. I can tell just from your voice that you are well and healthy, Lily. Lily could hear the relief in Kevin's voice just as clearly. This was part of the incredible connection the two of them shared, and the source of so much of the perfect trust and faith they had in each other. Kevin and Lily talked for a few more minutes and then Kevin had to go. Lily felt a thousand times better when she hung up. She turned to Rachel. Now, let's get to work. Unfortunately, no matter how Lily, Rachel, and Lily's doctor, Dr. Serafina Willow, discussed the problem, they couldn't find a surefire way to dispel all of the rumors and lies that were clouding Lily's campaign for mayor of Chicago. Lily's friend Nancy sat back from the others and said nothing. However, she was thinking about the situation in front of her the whole time. Nancy knew that these honest and forthright ladies would never come up with a solution to combat the lies and deception being spread by Hayden Smart, Lily's main competitor for the office of mayor. Stunts like the one Hayden was pulling could only be combated by even bigger stunts. That was just the kind of thing that Nancy was good at. Nancy didn't really care about Lily at all or her bid for mayor. Nancy wasn't even actually pregnant. She was only pretending to be so that Lily would think that they were pregnancy pals. In reality, when Nita Hernandez was paying Nancy to keep a close eye on Lily and report back to Juanita, Lately, Nancy knew her employment with Juanita was on rocky ground. She also knew that Juanita was behind the idea for Lily to run for mayor in the first place. So if Juanita wanted Lily's campaign to succeed, Nancy was going to do everything she could to make sure that it did. Nancy slipped out of the room and put in a call to Ethan Williams, Kevin's cousin. Nancy had gone on a few dates with Ethan, hoping that she could con him into a marriage that would give Nancy access to the Williams family fortune. The dates hadn't gone to Nancy's plan, to say the least, but that didn't mean Nancy was above using Ethan for her own ends. Ethan picked up before the phone got through its first ring. Ethan, honey, it's me, Nancy. Nancy, hi. I'm surprised to hear from you, Ethan replied. You didn't return any of my last 43 voice messages or text messages. Really? 
I must have missed them somehow. Nancy privately rolled her eyes. Ethan's pursuit of her was so pathetic she almost felt bad for the poor slob. Nancy put a coy tone into her voice. The thing is, honey, there's this special little project that I could really use your help with. Sure, I'd do anything for you, Nancy. Nancy smiled to herself. That's just what I like to hear, Ethan. The thing is, I'm going to need you to kidnap Lily Williams. There was a shocked silence on the other end of the phone. Finally, Ethan replied, Kidnap Lily Williams? You mean, again? Lily was relieved to get a phone call from Kevin, whose adventures on the moon were somewhat chaotic to the point that Lily had been alerted by Stanley Cooper that Kevin was in danger. While Kevin cures and enlists Zip Murlot as his aid in trekking to the dark side of the moon, Lily deals with her mayoral campaign while being unaware of the various plots that are rising against her, such as supposed pal Nancy's idea to have Ethan Williams kidnap Lily yet again. Kevin felt great happiness in his heart after his short moon-to-earth telephone call with Lily who assured him that she and the baby were doing fine and that her campaign was moving into high gear. With no worries about Lily's activities in Chicago, Kevin resumed his quest to find Quentin Covington's compound on the dark side of the moon with the help of stranded astronaut Zip Murlot. Kevin gripped the lunar rover's T-shaped hand controller tighter as he aimed the buggy directly into the void that was the dark side of the moon. Zara was in the seat beside him. The arm of her spacesuit was still in the splint Kevin had applied to hold her broken arm in place. Zip stood behind them, holding on to the back of the seats as the rover was not designed for more than two people. Zip pointed ahead. There's where I saw those last figures, the ones that had me bugging out, thinking my brain might have been making them up, he said over his radio. That's good enough for me, Kevin replied, and he urged the lunar rover to go a little faster. They crossed the Terminator in the blink of an eye. Instantly, they could feel the incredible drop in temperature even through their spacesuits. This side of the moon never saw the light of the sun. It was utterly and completely dark, except for the dim pinpricks of stars shining far out in the galaxy. Kevin thumbed down the lunar rover's lights. Now they could see 40 feet ahead of them, but that was all. You never came to this side of the moon at all? Zara asked Zip. Once or twice, I came when I heard those tunes coming from this direction, but I didn't have any lights powerful enough to see more than a few feet ahead of me, so there didn't seem to be much point, Zip replied. Besides, you know how it is, young blood. Seen one moon rock, you've seen them all. Inside his helmet, Kevin pushed a dispenser to release one of the herbal enhancement pills he had prepared in anticipation of this trip. This one was to enhance his already finely attuned senses. As soon as the herbal concoction hit his bloodstream, Kevin felt his eyesight sharpen, his hearing grew more acute, and even his sense of smell improved tenfold. His pupils expanded until his irises were no more than thin rings as they tried to take in any available light. The blackness took on subtle shades, and to his left, Kevin could see a shape darker than the blackness around it, jutting up from the moon's surface. Over there, Kevin pointed. I can see some kind of human-made structure just above the horizon. Kevin turned the lunar rover in that direction. Fifteen minutes later, they crested the rim of a crater and could see down into the giant hole that had been carved into the surface of the moon. Along one edge of the crater, lights glowed out from the remains of something that looked a little bit like the largest oil field in history. What in holy heaven happened here? Zip breathed into his radio. The crater was enormous, as if some hungry god had taken an ice cream scoop to the lunar surface. I think we found where the moon's moon came from, Kevin replied. Kevin parked up against a loading bay door. Zara. Stay with the rover. I have a pretty good idea of what we're about to encounter, and I don't want you in the middle of it, especially with your broken arm. Zara gave a salute with her good arm. I hear you, Kevin. I'll stay here and crew our getaway vehicle in case we need it. She gave the lunar rover an affectionate pat. 
Kevin and Zip entered the structure. They seemed to be on the floor of a giant assembly line. Conveyor belts crisscrossed the massive space in a tangled maze that seemed to go in every direction at once. How could I not know this was here? Zip wondered. How could NASA and all the astronomers on Earth be out to lunch and miss it? Quentin Covington developed a special kind of super glass that was entirely reflective, Kevin explained. He noticed a small piece of super glass no bigger than his palm that had been discarded on the floor. He picked it up and showed it to Zip. Even if someone did get a look on this side of the moon, they would have only seen the reflection in the glass of more moonscape. I'm not trying to call you out, Kevin. Zip looked around the huge space with concern. But how are you going to find one little piece of blueprint in such a huge space? We need to look for an office or the personnel quarters of whoever was running this place, Kevin replied. That's the most likely. Kevin cut off his own words because his enhanced senses were suddenly crackling with warnings. Kevin pointed to a catwalk high above the assembly line floor. Think you can get up there fast? He asked Zip. No problem. In low gravity, anybody can climb like a monkey, Zip replied. Good. Then get climbing. There's going to be a battle. Zip looked offended. I may be old, but there's still some fight left in these fists. This isn't going to be an ordinary fight. Now move, Kevin warned. He could sense the presence of warriors with levels in the building. There were a lot of them, and they were approaching their location fast. The command in Kevin's voice was undeniable. Zip bounded for one of the catwalk's support beams and scaled it hand over hand easily. Just then, 200 warriors burst into the room. Kevin could sense they all had levels between 3 and 5. Their spacesuit showed the Maverick insignia. Kevin's helmet radio crackled to life as the Mavericks found his frequency. Your entry here is unauthorized, the Maverick commander barked over the radio. Surrender immediately or deadly force will be used against you. I would like to see you try, Kevin laughed. The lead commander pointed at Kevin. Team 1, apprehend the trespasser. Twenty of the Mavericks charged Kevin at once. Their steps were bounding and inefficient in the low gravity of the moon. The Mavericks had not adjusted their fighting style to meet the needs of their environment yet. Kevin reached deep within himself to where his level 7 abilities lay. Although he had only been on the moon a short time, Kevin had been thinking about the most efficient way to utilize his abilities since he had first begun to plan this trip. He focused his powers inward, pushing them out in every cell in his body, strengthening them, giving them weight and mass. This change was offset by his level's ability to increase his strength. Kevin was suddenly five times heavier, but with no loss of power or agility. The first team of Mavericks charged at him, feet and fist flying, but with low gravity they had no force behind them. Their blows bounced off Kevin harmlessly. He swatted them as if they were flies, and their bodies flew through the room crunching into machinery and conveyor belts. Their suits tore like tissue, and the life-supporting oxygen inside rushed out into the void of space. Teams 2, open fire, yelled the Maverick commander. Forty more Mavericks drew rifles, stepped forward, and opened fire at Kevin. Instantly, Kevin reduced his mass so he could dive out of the hail of bullets. He almost flew as he stretched his body long to snatch up the discarded bit of super glass he had zipped only moments before. He used it to deflect the bullets back at the Mavericks. The piece of glass was tiny and left no room for error, but Kevin's movements were precise and perfect. Every deflected bullet found its secondary target, and half the remaining Mavericks were wiped out in seconds. He can't fight us all, the Maverick leader screamed with delusional optimism. All teams, charge! He was at least a commander who led from the front. Kevin once again increased his mass, grabbed the commander, and swung him bodily at the rest of his men, using him as a combination shield and bludgeon. Help! I need help over here, yelled Zip through the radio. Kevin saw a figure without a Maverick insignia on his spacesuit hacking through the catwalk supports. Zip was too far away from the walls or other sections to get off the narrow walk he clung to. Before Kevin could answer, Zara yelled back over the radio. 
on my way. Suddenly, the lunar rover burst through the door with Zara at the controls. She spun the rover in a wide arc. The not Maverick jumped away barely in time to avoid getting smashed between the rover and the last support strut of the catwalk. Get in, Zara yelled to Zip. Zip slid down the support strut, landing lightly in the back of the rover. That's some fine driving, Foxy Mama. When we get back Earthside, you'll have to take a spin in my LT-1 Corvette. Unless it's an automatic, I should wait for my arm to heal. Zara spun the lunar rover in a wide circle as several of the Mavericks left off fighting Kevin and tried to grab her and zip. Kevin knew they wouldn't be able to dodge the Maverick forever. The crowded assembly line floor didn't leave enough room to maneuver. He reached again deep into himself to where his level 7 power slay. Why is his helmet glowing? screamed one of the Mavericks in fear. Indeed, eerie blue light blasted from the faceplate of helmet. He unleashed his powers in a controlled burst at the remaining Mavericks. They were blasted back by the power. It hadn't been enough to kill the Mavericks, but the concussive force inside their helmets was sufficient to knock them all unconscious. Zip had retrieved a heavy wrench from the Lunar Rover's toolbox and took out the last of the remaining Mavericks harassing the rover. Zip waved the wrench in triumph. Stellar teamwork. You two can join my crew and... He was cut off when the figure without the Maverick insignia dropped from an overhanging beam onto the back of the rover. The figure grabbed Zip and put a gun to the old astronaut's worn and fragile spacesuit. Freeze, Kevin Williams, the figure ordered over the radios. And none of your level 7 tricks. One hint of blue from your helmet, and Robinson Cosmos here gets it. Kevin slowly put his hands in the air. He knew that voice. He'd been expecting it every minute since he landed on the moon. Mario Kessler, Kevin proclaimed. We meet again. Kevin and his tech whiz Zara traveled to the moon, believing Quentin Covington's sixth and final outpost and the last piece to the mysterious blueprint were on the dark side of the moon. Kevin Zara and Commander Zip Murlot, an astronaut who had been stranded on the moon for the last 50 years, trekked to the dark side of the moon in spacesuits in a lunar rover. They found Quentin's moon base and battled against the Mavericks that had been left to guard the defunct factory. But just as victory was in sight, Zara and Zip were taken captive by an old and unexpected enemy of Kevin's, Mario Kessler. Wait, Mario who? Zara asked. She was in the driver's seat of the lunar rover that Kevin had hotwired. Behind her, the strange man held Zip hostage, threatening to tear open the old astronaut's ancient spacesuit. A few feet away, Kevin held hands up in surrender, unwilling to risk Zip's life. Mario Kessler, the man hissed over their radios. Scion of the great and powerful Kessler family. The man who was going to win the epic clash. Until you pointed a lane the wrong way and accidentally blasted yourself into space, Kevin added. His voice took on an ethereal tone. And in space, I found my true powers. Powers beyond levels, beyond anything you could ever even dream of, Kevin Williams. He put a hand dramatically to his chest. I became a god in the space between the stars. Zara frowned. Except that part of the epic clash wasn't really in space. It was all just a virtual reality simulation. How'd you get any mystical powers when you were just inside a standard issue VR program? It was a really good simulation, yelled Mario. Kevin shook his head. I don't buy it. The herbalist society who were running the Epic Clash are good, but even they aren't that good. What really happened after you blasted yourself into VR space? Mario pouted. I don't know what happened to me, he finally admitted. I woke up somewhere in the middle of the Australian outback. I think the Herbalist Society just dumped me where they thought no one would find the body and left me for dead. Mario tightened his hold on Zip's spacesuit, the fragile old material stretch threatening to fray with any increase in force. They were all on the assembly floor of a defunct factory on the moon and it wasn't pressurized for life support. 
The smallest tear would mean the end of Zip's life from invading cold and loss of oxygen. And dead is just what your old friend here will be if you don't do just as I say. Line up and start heading for those red doors, Mario commanded. Kevin and Zara obeyed, walking in front of Mario, who brought up the rear with his gun trained on Zip. Since Mario couldn't see their faces, Kevin toggled his radio to a private channel so he could speak to Zip and Zara without Mario overhearing. Whatever happens, go along with what I say, Kevin told them. The best way to get information out of Mario is to let him think he's got the upper hand. You got it, Kevin, Zara replied. 10-4. Zip muttered, turning his head so Mario wouldn't see his lips move. Mario marched them through the factory. Kevin kept a sharp eye out, memorizing the layout and noting anything that might come in handy later. He saw a lot of the technology he had found in Quentin's other compounds, massive robots, GMO food, and piles of the super glass. Eventually, Mario brought them to the staff quarters through a series of airlocks until they reached a lavish decorated executive living suite. It was decorated in soft gray with a huge window overlooking part of the factory. The massive crater on the moon's surface and the twinkling stars far beyond. Take your helmets off, Mario ordered, taking off his own. This apartment has its own life support. He nudged the gun into Zip's ribs. But don't try anything cute, Kevin. I've got your little moon man hostage and I have no problems with killing him if you make trouble. You may not be able to outrun my bullets up here in zero gravity. Kevin wasn't so sure that he could avoid any bullet that Mario might shoot at him on the moon, but he also wasn't going to bet Zip's life on it. Not at close range, anyway. So you wound up in the Australian outback, Kevin prompted. He needed to get Mario talking and distracted again so Kevin could scan the room for possible hiding places for the sixth piece of Quentin Covington's mysterious blueprint. The executive living quarters were exactly the kind of place it might be hidden. Is that where you and Quentin Covington joined forces? Quentin Covington? Join forces with me? Mario laughed bitterly. Once upon a time, Quentin Covington would have begged just to get a job interview with my family. Mario turned to Zip in a blatant attempt for sympathy. But that was before the so-called great Kevin Williams destroyed my entire family and left me a penniless orphan alone in the world. Zip crossed his arms. The old astronaut had faced death too many times to be frightened by it now, especially at the hands of someone like Mario Kessler. Sorry, man. I'm not buying that jive you're talking about. Actually, I did have to take down the Kessler family, Kevin admitted. But in my defense, they were using an orphanage to funnel children to training as secluded Valley assassins. And that was just the tip of the iceberg of their illegal business tactics in Washington, D.C., which had created a number of wars between rival factions that led to death. I was glad to see Raymond Kessler die, and to see the Kessler family's fortunes die with him. You're the one who's going to be brought down now, Kevin, Mario laughed. He gestured out the window at the massive crater. I don't care how much money and power you have. You've missed your chance to get in on this. Kevin shot Zara a look. She knew it was her signal to jump in. She also waved at the crater. Exactly what is this? Or, I mean, exactly what was that? We've been collecting pieces of a blueprint from all of Quentin's compounds, but we're still missing the last piece. Without it, we can't figure out what his plan is. There. Mario pointed grandly out the window again, but this time he pointed up at a particularly bright star that seemed unusually close. Zip squinted up at it. That's no star. It's not twinkling at all. Which means it's some kind of satellite, Kevin added. Some kind of satellite or... A space station, Mario couldn't help interrupting. The biggest, most luxurious, most expensive space station ever conceived. Oh my god, Zara exclaimed. That's what NASA has been calling the moon's new moon. That's what made the giant crater? That's the Covington Industries Luxury Condos Incorporated, Mario crowed. People will pay Quentin and the Pinnacle billions of dollars for a place on Silky. 
Even while being held hostage, Zip had to see the lighter side of things. Silky? Who the heck thought of that name? Mario's rage grew. I did. I suggested the hard C. Despite the gun in his ribs, Zip couldn't help but to mock Mario. Brilliant. But you know, I've lived in space for 50 years, Zip said with a shake of his head. It's not all it's cracked up to be. Do you think people are going to pay some made-up amount of money just to float around like a bunch of sea monkeys in a jar? You've been smoking the wrong end of the pipe, man. But Kevin's blood had gone cold with the realization. Quentin and the Pinnacle would have gone through all this trouble if they weren't certain people would pay huge sums for their space condos. Quentin and the Pinnacle plan to give people no other choice, which means they'll have to destroy the Foundation and make the rest of the world unlivable. That's right, Mario laughed. Zara rolled her eyes at Mario. Don't be so happy about it. You just said that you didn't have any money after Kevin destroyed your family. That means you're going to be stuck on Earth along with the rest of us poor peons. Why do you think I went to work for Quentin in the first place? Mario snapped back. I knew that once I got on the inside of his operation, I'd find the leverage I needed to secure my place on the space station. And I have it. It's right here. Mario grabbed a small doll statue from a table and waved it around. Quentin will have to let me on the space station when he finds out I have this. Without it, all his plans and schemes will think. Zara peered at it. It was a figure with slumped, defeated shoulders and a subservient tilt to its head. Zara read the small plaque at the bottom. Covington Industries' most adequate employee of the month, Mario Kessler? I don't get it. Why would Quentin care about some lame... But Kevin suddenly dove for Mario, tackling him to the ground. The statue fell from his hand. Mario roared with surprise and outrage. He aimed the gun at Kevin and fired. In less than a heartbeat, Kevin lightened his mass, easily dodging out of the way of the speeding bullet, which shot past him and shattered the huge picture window. The vacuum of space instantly sucked the oxygen from the room. Anything not nailed down was also sucked out, including Zara and Zip. They flew through the departing air, arms and legs flailing for purchase on anything. But there was nothing they could grab onto that would save them. At the last second, Kevin grabbed hold of both of them, increasing his mass with his level 7 power so he acted like an anchor. Zara and Zip were safe but flying debris sliced into their suits, tearing several holes. While Kevin was saving Zara and Zip, Mario managed to grab the statue. He wedged himself behind a desk which was anchored to the floor. He popped his helmet back on and clawed his way along the floor to the apartment's airlock. Right before he slammed the airlock closed, Mario screamed into his radio, Goodbye, Kevin. This time it's you who's being left to die in space. Kevin Zar and Commander Zip Murlot, an astronaut who had been stranded on the moon for the last 50 years, successfully invaded Quentin Covington's sixth and final outpost on the dark side of the moon. While Kevin evolved his level 7 powers for low-gravity fighting, Zip was captured by Mario Kessler, whom Kevin had competed against in the epic clash. Mario revealed that Quentin and the Pinnacle had built the massive luxury space station, which NASA had mistaken for the moon's new moon. Quentin and the Pinnacle planned to sell condos on the station at astronomical prices. But Mario believed he had the key to get in for free, an Employee of the Month trophy. When Kevin tries to take the award from Mario, Mario accidentally shoots out the window of the pressurized room. Kev the window, but Mario escaped. The sound of the air rushing out of the executive living quarters whistled in Kevin's ears as he clung to Zara and Zip desperate to keep them from being blown out of the shattered window. Kevin transferred his grip on his two team members to one hand. Faster than the human eye could follow, Kevin snatched up a paperweight as it flew by. With all the force he could muster, he threw it at the shutter release button beside the window. The paperweight hit dead on. As always, Kevin's aim was infallible. The airtight shutter rattled down, sealing off the broken window. 
Zara and Zip bounced gently to the ground in the moon's lessened gravity. Thank you, Kevin, Zara cried. You saved our bacon for sure, young blood, Zip added. Why did you suddenly go after Mario and that silly trophy he had? Zara wanted to know. Who cares about an award for being Covington Industries' most adequate employee of the month? It wasn't the trophy itself I cared about. There must be something attached to it or inside it that Mario believes Quentin will be willing to trade for a condo worth billions on the space station. The only thing that I can imagine Quentin wanting that much would be a key piece to his in the Pinnacle's evil scheme, Kevin explained. Kevin, that's brilliant, Zara exclaimed. It must be the sixth piece of the blueprint. But we still don't know what the blueprint is for. We know this Quentin Joker wouldn't care about the blueprint for his space station because it's already been completed and taken off. Zip pointed out the remaining intact window at the glowing bright dot hovering above the moon's surface. Then the blueprint must be the other essential part of the Pinnacle and Quentin's plan, Kevin deduced with his faultless logic. It must be whatever they plan to use to make the Earth uninhabitable and force all of the rich people to buy expensive condos on the space station. I have to get that piece of blueprint before Quentin does, Kevin declared. We can't let them complete their plan. Also, I need to know what this doomsday device is so that I know how to stop them, just in case there's a copy of that blueprint somewhere else. Right then, the entire moon base shook with a terrible force. Through the window, the three of them could see a bright explosion as a single passenger space shuttle launched itself from the far end of the compound. I bet that's Mario heading for the space station now, Zip guessed. Kevin, you can't let him get away, Zara exclaimed. Go after him. We'll be fine here. Kevin was faster and stronger than Zara, who was a tech whiz but not a martial artist, or Zip, who was in his eighth decade. Furthermore, Zara and Zip's spacesuits had been damaged by the flying objects in the executive suite after Mario had shot out the window. Only the executive suite had life support. Suddenly, a loud warning klaxon sounded and a computerized voice rang out through the room. Oxygen supplies have reached critical limits. Life support will end in five minutes and counting. Please put on your emergency spacesuit immediately. Zip ran to the closet marked emergency supplies and flung the door open. It was empty inside. Looks like the cupboard is bare, he remarked with admirable calm. Stay here, Kevin ordered. I'll find something to repair your spacesuits. Like what? Kevin, these suits are the only things that will keep us alive outside this room. This isn't something you can fix with super glue and duct tape, Zara exclaimed. Kevin was already at the airlock door. If my guess is right, exactly what I need is already in this factory. Kevin dashed out the airlock, making sure to close it securely behind him. The alarm continued to sound and the computer voice continued its countdown. Life support will end in 4 minutes and 30 seconds and counting, it chanted. Kevin raced through the factory. While Mario had marched them to the executive suite, Kevin had kept an eye out and noticed many of the inventions he had found in Quentin's compounds on Earth were also in use on his moon base. He just had to find the right one. Kevin bypassed sealed 55-gallon drums labeled GMO corn, not for human consumption. He darted around rocks holding giant panes of the super glass and hooked a laugh around a giant robotic worker that had toppled onto its side. Beyond the robot, he found what he was looking for. There was a door labeled Resin Storage Center. Kevin dashed inside and then stopped. The room was empty. Kevin's heart sank. The resin was his only chance to save Zara and Zip. But as he turned to go out the door, he noticed something in a corner. It was a small piece of leftover resin no bigger than the palm of his hand. If Kevin had turned the other way when he was exiting, he would have missed it entirely. Kevin scooped it up, his mind racing. He needed a way to cure the resin once it had been applied to the holes in Zara and Zip's suits. On another adventure, he used a lighter and heat to create the seal, holding the resin in place on a hot air balloon. He couldn't count on something similar working here on the moon. Ordinary fire was too chancy with so much oxygen in the air, 
and if the life support system ran out before Kevin could seal the holes, it wouldn't work at all. Kevin ran back through the factory. There had to be something here that Quentin Covington's workers had used for welding when they built the space station. Life support will end in three minutes and counting, chanted the computer voice. Kevin raided equipment lockers and improvised tool sheds on the factory floor. He dug through piles of discarded supplies and kicked down doors to equipment rooms. He could find nothing that could be used to create intense heat in the vacuum of space. Had the space crew taken all the welding equipment with them when the space station had launched itself off the moon? Life support will end in one minute and 30 seconds, the computer voice reminded Kevin. And then Kevin spotted what he needed. There was a large crate strangely labeled scuba equipment. Kevin kicked off the lid. Inside, he found everything needed for underwater welding. Kevin knew that wet welding relied on an electric arc shielded by the release of a gas around it to both feed the arc and protect the welder from being electrocuted. In the cold vacuum of space, there was a danger of the welds cooling too quickly to create the necessary bonds, but Kevin would just have to take his chances. Zara and Zip's lives depended on it. Kevin raced back to the executive suite. Zara and Zip were gasping as the air supply was running low already. Life support will end in one minute and counting, the computer voice told them. Do Zip's suit first, Zara offered. His suit is worse than mine. Zip had been stuck on the moon for more than 50 years. His suit was old and had seen a lot of wear. Kevin quickly prepared the area around the holes and applied the resin, but Kevin had to then cure the resin to make sure the repairs would hold. Make sure you hold completely still, Kevin commanded Zip. One false move and Kevin could easily destroy Zip's suit or his body. Zip obeyed. Kevin fired up the welder. Fortunately, Zip's suit had been designed to withstand the high temperatures of direct sunlight without the insulating properties of the atmosphere on the moon. The wet welder's stream of gas obscured Kevin's ability to see what he was doing. He had to operate as much from feel and instinct as he did from his other senses. Life support will end in 30 seconds and counting. The computer voice chimed, just as Kevin finished curing the last of the resin on Zip's suit. Zip tried moving and flexing to test the sealed holes. Better than new. Wish I had some of that fancy goop 50 years ago. Would have made my life on this rock a lot easier. Kevin turned to Zara's suit. Hurry, Kevin, she urged. But Kevin couldn't hurry. He had to use the same exact precision and attention to detail on Zara's suit to ensure it could keep her alive. There. Done. Get your helmet on. Kevin ordered just as the computer voice announced. Life support will end in zero seconds. Life support has ended. Zip tossed Zara her helmet, but Zara had broken her arm when the rocket she and Kevin arrived in crash landed. She tried to catch the helmet with one hand but bobbled it. The helmet crashed to the floor and rolled away. I've got it, Kevin yelled. The temperature in the room was plummeting to 300 degrees below zero, which it often was on this side of the moon where the sun's rays never shone. Zara's lips were already blue and she was shaking too hard to grasp her own helmet. Kevin plunked the helmet on her head and locked it into place. Zara's life support system engaged, immediately filling her suit with warm oxygenated air. Thanks, Kevin. That was close. Zara looked out the undamaged window. They could still see Mario's single-person space shuttle heading for the light of Quentin Space Station. But how are we going to catch up to Mario in the last piece of the blueprint now? Quentin planned to use this lunar station as a transfer point between Earth and the space station, Kevin told her. You know what that has to mean, right? Mario Kessler was feeling very smug as he piloted his single-person space shuttle towards the bright light of Quentin Covington Space Station. Quentin, that arrogant jerk, would dance to Mario's tune as soon as he realized that Mario had the all-important piece to the blueprint for Quentin's doomsday device. Mario had finally even defeated Kevin Williams, leaving him to die in the freezing eternal night of the dark side of the moon. Life could not be better. The shut-automated computer voice came on. 
secondary vehicle approaching from the rear at an unsafe speed, the computer informed Mario. Mario frowned. What the heck could that be? He had slit the throats of all of the remaining Maverick mercenaries whom Kevin had knocked out during his battle on the assembly line floor. Show the view from the rear cameras, Mario ordered the space shuttle. A video feed popped up on the main control panel. It showed a secondary shuttle closer than Mario would have guessed possible. It was so close, in fact, that Mario could easily identify the person at the second shuttle's controls. Mario's face turned red as he screamed with rage. Kevin! Kevin Zarr and Commander Zip Murlot, an astronaut who had been stranded on the moon for the last 50 years, successfully invaded Quentin Covington's sixth and final outpost on the dark side of the moon. There, Kevin encountered Mario Kessler, an old enemy. Mario turned off the compound life support and fled the compound with the final piece of the mysterious blueprint in a one-man space shuttle. Kevin had to scramble to repair Zara's and Zip's damaged spacesuits before they could pursue Mario in a shuttle of their own. The shuttle that Kevin had taken from Quentin Covington's compound on the dark side of the moon was much larger than Mario's one-man space shuttle. However, the inside was not nearly as comfortable. Zip, the old astronaut, gripped his bench seat as the shuttle shook. Kevin had pushed the shuttle to its top speed in an effort to catch up to Mario's flaying rocket. I feel like we're the last three peas in a tin can, Zip exclaimed. Through the window at the front of the shuttle, they could see Mario's shuttle just ahead. Mario was heading for the bright dot in the sky that was Quentin's luxury space station, Silky. Kevin could tell his bigger craft wasn't built for speed, but it was very powerful. Kevin pushed the shuttle harder, but couldn't gain on Mario. Zara, run diagnostics on this shuttle. Why isn't all this power translating into more speed? Kevin commanded. I'm on it. Zara was hampered by a broken arm, so her typing wasn't up to a dual lightning speed. She had another concern. Kevin, how are we going to stop Mario? Even if we can catch up to him, we can't risk crashing his shuttle and then having the sixth piece of the blueprint destroyed. I'll let you know once we catch up to him, Kevin replied. In truth, Kevin was still formulating his plan, but he had perfect faith in his own abilities and those of his team. The shuttle's computer beeped, indicating the diagnosis report was ready. Zara skimmed it. Here's the problem, Kevin. This shuttle is carrying several tons of cargo. That's what's slowing us down. That explains why they didn't send any bread on the accommodations, Zip added. This here's nothing but a space freighter. I'd better check out the cargo hold. Maybe we can lighten the load, Kevin decided. Zip, can you take the controls? It had been 50 years since Zip had the chance to pilot a spacecraft. He had come to the moon on a NASA mission, but had then been suspected of contracting a space virus that had given him a terrible rash. Rather than risk infecting the entire planet, Zip had stayed alone on the moon. Kevin realized the rash was only an allergic reaction and had cured Zip. Ever since, the aged astronaut had been game for whatever Kevin needed. 10-4, good buddy. Zip hopped into the pilot seat. If she's got wings, I can fly her. Kevin left Zip and Zara to keep on Mario's tail while he hurried to the cargo hold. Half the cargo was ridiculous luxury items from Quentin Covington's space station, like solid gold toilets with seats covered in baby seal skin, designer space boots with magnetized soles, and bejeweled Monopoly board games. But the other half of the cargo made Kevin smile. This was exactly what he needed to stop Mario. While still at Quentin Covington's sixth compound on the dark side of the moon, Kevin had needed to repair Zip and Zara's damaged spacesuits. He knew Quentin was using an amazing kind of resin that had been used to build an ancient Cambodian temple in the construction of his space station. But when Kevin searched the moon base compound, he found only a tiny sliver of the resin left. Now Kevin knew why that was. The rest of the resin had been packed into this shuttle's co hold. It was probably about to be sent to Quentin's space station, but Kevin had a much better use for it. 
Zara's voice came over Kevin's radio. How's it going back there, Kevin? Did you find what's slowing us down? I did, Kevin replied. I'm going to start tossing some of this useless cargo so we can catch up to Mario. Kevin worked at super speed, blowing the crates of ridiculous luxuries out of the airlocks. He could feel the shuttle's engines increase in speed. Kevin, it's working, Zip called back over the radio. We're right up on that chump's butt. Great, Kevin radioed back. Now I need you to get us in front of him, but just barely. You understand? Whatever you say, young blood, Zip replied. I'll let you know as soon as we're in position. In his one-man shuttle, Mario Kessler watched in horror as the larger spacecraft looked like it was going to ram him. Mario couldn't believe it. Everyone on both shuttles could be killed if Kevin crashed the shuttles. But just as the bigger shuttle would have made contact, it zipped around Mario's shuttle. Mario couldn't figure out what Kevin had planned. Was he trying to get to Quentin's space station before Mario? But Quentin would never let an enemy like Kevin on this precious space station. Mario leaned forward in his seat trying to see if the other shuttle was still gaining speed. Suddenly, a goopy mass of some stringy substance slammed into Mario's windscreen with a splat. Meanwhile, back on Earth, Kevin's cousin Ethan Williams was plotting to kidnap Kevin's wife, Lily, again. Once more, kidnapping Lily hadn't really been Ethan's idea. Lily's friend and pregnancy pal, Nancy, had proposed the idea to Ethan. Here's the problem, Nancy explained over the phone. Lily is trying to run for mayor of Chicago, right? But there's all these rumors about her going around. Her opponent, Hayden Smart, claims she isn't even really pregnant. Some people claim she killed that guy, Sid, when he tried to carjack us. People think Sid died from an overdose of Williams and Williams pharmaceutical pills. The stories are over the place, and none of them are good. And kidnapping Lily is going to help all that? Ethan added though he couldn't really see how and didn't like to ask. He and Nancy had gone on a couple of dates and Ethan was already head over heels in love with Nancy. The last thing he wanted was to look stupid in her eyes. Fortunately, Nancy continued to explain, that's right, suddenly instead of a bunch of stories about Lily, there'll just be one story, one that we control and it's one that makes Lily look absolutely sympathetic. Then she'll have no trouble winning the election for mayor. But Ethan had another concern. I don't want to get in trouble with Kevin again. The last time that happened, it didn't go so well for me. Yes, he's my mortal enemy who has ruined my life. But every time I try to get revenge on him, it seems that I get further behind. Don't worry about Kevin, Nancy assured him. He's off in outer space doing something with NASA. It'll all be over and done with by the time he gets back. They talked for a few more minutes and Nancy gave Ethan all the information he needed to know to make the kidnapping happen. But after Ethan hung up, he started to have second thoughts. He really didn't want to fall afoul again of Kevin's highly developed protective instincts when it came to Lily. Also, Lily knew what Ethan looked like, so she'd be sure to know Ethan was involved. Ethan pondered the problem until he hit upon the perfect solution. Instead of Ethan risking everything to kidnap Lily, he would be the one to save her. Ethan imagined himself swooping in, beating off Lily's abductors, winning Kevin's undying gratitude, and Nancy giving him a great big kiss and maybe something more for making it all happen. Of course, that meant that Ethan now needed someone else to be the kidnapper. Fortunately, he knew just the person. Ethan made a short trip down his grungy apartment building's hallway and knocked on his neighbor's door. Nancy hurried into the free clinic Lily's charity The Lily Pad had recently opened on Chicago's south side. Nancy made sure the back door was unlocked. In a few minutes, Ethan would sneak in through that door in order to kidnap Lily just as Nancy had planned. Nancy checked the sight lines from the back door to Lily's office, where she would be working as usual this time of day. It was perfect. Ethan could be in and out of the clinic without anyone seeing him. Nancy passed by the office, planning to give Lily a quick wave before standing guard at the far end of the hall, just in case any of the staff wanted to ask Lily a question or something. But when Nancy passed the office, she didn't see Lily, and Nancy knew that could be a problem. Lily? Nancy called as she stepped inside. 
there was no sign of Lily anywhere. Nancy checked her watch. Ethan would be here any minute. She pulled out her phone to call him to tell him to hold off until Nancy could find Lily. But the movement jostled the pillow Nancy had stuffed under her shirt. Nancy wasn't really pregnant. She was only faking in order to get close to Lily on Juanita Hernandez's orders. Nancy put down her phone to quickly readjust the pillow. The darn thing never stayed in place. Nancy was going to have to devise some kind of harness for it now or some way to secure it, perhaps a glue. Nancy was patting her shirt smooth again when her world suddenly went dark. Someone had thrown a blanket over her head. Nancy opened her mouth to scream, but a hand clamped over her mouth and she felt herself being picked up and carried away. Kevin Zara and Commander Zip Murlot, an astronaut who had been stranded on the moon for the last 50 years, raced through space to capture Mario Kessler before he could reach Quentin Covington's luxury space station. Meanwhile, on Earth, Nancy decided to improve Lily's chances of getting elected as mayor of Chicago. Hoping to create sympathy for Lily, Nancy plotted to have Ethan Williams, Kevin's problematic cousin, kidnap Lily. But when Ethan decided to improve the kidnapping plan, Nancy found herself getting abducted instead. Nancy kicked and fought against the smothering blanket over her head as she was carried out the back door of Lily's community health clinic. It was no use. Her captor was too strong. The next thing she knew, Nancy was tossed into a footlocker smelling of grease paint, and the lid was slammed shut. She heard the roar of a gin and knew that she was in the back of a car or a truck. Fortunately, she was only driven for about 10 minutes before the vehicle stopped. Nancy gathered her strength, bent her knees, and kicked out violently at the lid of the footlocker. The clasp broke off and the lid popped open. Nancy clawed the blanket from her head and looked around. She was in the back of a grungy van she didn't recognize. Where had Ethan gotten this old junker? And why had he grabbed Nancy when he was supposed to be after Lily? Suddenly, the back door of the van flew open. A large, grizzled-looking man with only three teeth glared at Nancy. Who the hell are you? Nancy demanded. Three teeth gave a little bow. Hello, ma'am. You'll understand if I don't give you my name, but I will be your kidnapper for this evening. The man's voice was perfectly calm and cultured, even though he did have a bit of a lisp due to the missing teeth. Nancy pinched the bridge of her nose. She could feel a migraine coming on. Don't tell me that idiot Ethan tried to outsource this kidnapping. Three teeth said nothing, apparently taking Nancy literally at her word. You weren't supposed to kidnap me, you moron, Nancy exclaimed. Three teeth crossed his heavily muscled arms. My instructions were to enter the free community clinic at exactly 5 p.m. through the back door, proceed to the first office on the left, and abduct the woman there who matched the description I was given. But I look nothing like the woman you were supposed to kidnap. Nancy rolled her eyes and tried to get up out of the trunk she was still sitting in. Three teeth gave her a gentle yet firm shove back down. You match the description perfectly. You're pregnant. Nancy waited, but apparently pregnant was all the description Ethan had bothered to give this strange man. I have to call Ethan and make him stop this farce, Nancy muttered to herself. She patted her pockets, but then remembered she had left her phone in Lily's office. Look, however much money Ethan promised you, I can pay you more, Nancy offered. She had been milking Juanita Hernandez for every penny Nancy could get and even scooping up what Lily and Kevin referred to as loose change around the Williams house. Nancy was delighted that the Williams' idea of loose change consisted of everything from gold coins to treasury bills to certificates of stock. Three Teeth looked offended. Ma'am, once he has accepted a role, one continues for the run of the performance. After all, the show must go on. Before Nancy could utter another word, he squashed her head back down into the footlocker, slammed the lid, and sat on it. Ethan peered around the corner of the building to where his neighbor's van had been parked. He would hear a woman's yells and screams for help even from here. Everything was going to plan. 
Ethan would storm the van, call out to Lily that he had come to save her, and then defeat his neighbor in a staged sword fight. Fortunately, Ethan's neighbor was a former Shakespearean actor and trained in stage combat. The poor fellow had been set to have a brilliant career treading the boards, until an overhead stage light had broken loose and smashed into his head. The man had lost most of his teeth and higher executive functions, but he was brilliant at following simple instructions. Better yet, he had agreed to kidnap Lily Williams for only $50, a case of beer, and a promise from Ethan to come see his one-man production of Henry V. Ethan had only taken a single step forward when he saw someone else running to the van. It was the last person he expected, Lily Williams. But how could that be? She was supposed to be kidnapped. But if Lily was free, who was in the van? Ethan tried to get a better look, but just then an open-top bus full of tourists pulled up beside the van and blocked his view entirely. At the same time, somewhere between the moon and Quentin Covington's newly launched luxury space station, Kevin, Zara, and Zip were in a cargo space shuttle and had just pulled the head of Mario Kessler's one-man spacecraft. Kevin knew in his mind that he had to stop Mario from reaching Quentin's space station. Mario had the sixth piece of the mysterious blueprint that was most likely a part of Quentin and the Pinnacle's plan to destroy the Foundation. Not only did Kevin have to stop Mario from getting Quentin the plan that would destroy the Earth, he had to retrieve that piece of the blueprint for himself. So Kevin devised an ingenious way to capture Mario and his spacecraft without injury to either. The cargo space shuttle had been carrying a huge load of the amazing resin that had been used to build an ancient Cambodian temple. Once it was cured by heat, the resin became incredibly flexible, yet impossible to break. Kevin knew he could form this resin into a kind of webbing to catch Mario's spacecraft, but he had to find a high-temperature heat source to cure the resin, or else it wouldn't bond properly. Kevin realized he could use the cargo shuttle's thrusters once he found the shuttle had an interior fuel port. Kevin hauled the biggest crate of resin he could carry to the interior fuel port. He unlocked the port and stuffed pieces of the resin in as fast as his hands could manage. The resin moved with the fuel into the superheated engines of the cargo shuttle. The high heat melted the resin into long, sticky strings before it was blown out of the shuttle's thrusters and directly onto Mario Kessler's spacecraft. Another huge mass of the stringy, sticky substance hit the windshield of Mario's spacecraft. It instantly hardened and fused. What the hell is this gunk? Mario exclaimed. He grabbed the spacecraft's controller and tried to steer out of the strange substance pouring from the thrusters of the cargo shuttle ahead of him. His spacecraft tried to obey but was held in place by the thick web now connecting Mario to Kevin's shuttle. Kevin checked the cargo shuttle's rear viewport. Mario's little one-man spacecraft was well and truly tangled in lines of resin, stretching from one spacecraft to the other. Kevin clicked his radio on. Zip. Zara. Cut the main thrusters. Cut them now. Kevin needed to make sure one end of the resin stayed tangled in his cargo shuttle's engines, or else Mario would get away. 10-4, Zip radioed back. Cutting engines now. Kevin heard the rockets instantly die. In the freezing void of space, they would cool instantly and so would the resin. The two spacecraft were now inextricably linked. Zara came on the radio. Kevin, without the main thrusters, the moon's gravity will eventually pull us back down. That's okay, Kevin assured her. He explained how he captured Mario's spacecraft with the resin. We can't use the main thrusters again without possibly losing Mario. Can you land us safely without them, Zep? No problem, oh good buddy. We still have the auxiliary thrusters. I can put us down light as a feather, Zip assured Kevin. Our present trajectory has us landing almost exactly where you and the young lady here first landed on the moon. Kevin smiled. That would be perfect. True to his word, Zip landed the connected spacecraft perfectly, sending up only the tiniest puffs of moon dust. Kevin had Zip and Zara stay safely in the cargo shuttle while he handled Mario. But Mario was already outside his one-man spacecraft. In one hand, he held the sad little trophy proclaiming him Covington Industries' most adequate employee of the month, 
But Kevin knew inside the statuette was the sixth precious piece of the blueprint that was the key to Quentin Devil's scheme. In Mario's other hand, he held a strange-looking laser gun. He waved it threateningly at Kevin. Stop right there, Mario commanded. Why does that gun look so familiar? Kevin asked, not intimidated in the least. Recognize it, do you? It's the same super laser gun from the Epic Clash, Mario proclaimed. I know that, Kevin said, but there's something you don't know. I know everything, Kevin, Mario interrupted. I know the part of the Epic Clash that took place in space was only a highly advanced VR projection. I know that I was never really sent flying into the Great Void after I misfired this gun. I know I woke up in the Australian Outback only because the Herbalist Society didn't want anyone finding my body. Right, Kevin agreed. But you don't know. I know that I'm about to kill you, Mark. I know this gun is real. He pointed it at Kevin's heart. I know this will be the last time I ever see you alive. Kevin tried one last time. But Mario, you don't know. Goodbye, Kevin. Mario screamed and pulled the trigger. The gun fired directly into Mario's chest. Kevin had a split second to see Mario's eyes go wide as the force of the blast launched his body off the surface of the moon and out into space. Mario soared off and away, getting smaller and smaller until he disappeared. Kevin picked up the trophy from where it had fallen from Mario's hand. What you don't know, Mario, Kevin finally finished, is that you're still pointing that laser gun the wrong way. Kevin called Zara and Zip from the cargo shuttle and explained what happened. It was past time for them to go home. Although Lily had assured Kevin that she was fine, he was anxious to get home and see for himself. They could easily return to Earth in the same rocket that Kevin and Zara had arrived in now that it was repaired. It's been one far out adventure with you two, Zip told them. I'm glad I got one last space flight in with you, but I'm sad to have to say so long. Zara was surprised. But Kevin cured your rash, Zip, and it was only an allergic reaction. You don't have a space virus at all. You can come home without worrying about infecting anyone. It's not that, young blood, Zip explained. I've been on this rock too long. The lower gravity has weakened my muscles and bones. I'd collapse like a marionette under the full strain of the pull of the Earth. The brave old astronaut sighed. I thought I'd made my peace with dying up here all alone, but maybe I was just jive-talking to myself. He looked at the moon's horizon where the big blue marble that was the Earth was just beginning to rise. Seeing it like this, with home so close and still so far away, it about just breaks my heart. In space, no one can cry. There's not enough gravity to pull the tears down a person's cheeks. But inside his space helmet, a tiny drop of water floated free of Zip's eye and shimmered for a moment before it was sucked into his rebreather. Then Kevin spoke up. I have an idea. 